please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Monica Duran. Here. Janice Hoppy. Present. Zachary Urban. Present. Tim Fitzgerald. Here. Larry Matthews. Here. Genevieve Wooden. Present. We have a quorum. George Pond and Christy Davis have excused themselves. George Pond and Christy Davison will not be with us tonight, yes. Correct. Thank you. We still have a quorum. Normally I do an approval of the council study notes, at, uh, council notes which are right now are the council study notes of June 5. Um, I discovered there may have been something that's not quite accurate and I, we've had a discussion but haven't got it cleared up yet. So we're going to hold the actual approval of those to the following meeting. Any, and that we, the clerk and I have discussed it. We have a deputy clerk tonight because our clerk will be sort of training our, our deputy clerk for temporary usage. I don't believe we have any proclamations or ceremonies tonight, so we can move right into the program, which is, starts with um, citizens' right to speak. And there's no one on this particular item, which is items that are not on the agenda. Any changes in tonight's agenda? Seeing done, we'll go forward, starting with the consent agenda. Genevieve? Genevieve? Thank you, Madam Mayor. There are two items tonight. The first is resolution number 24-2017, a resolution approving an agreement between the City of Wheat Ridge and the Wheat Ridge Historical Society. That was item 1A, and item 1B is resolution number 23-2017, a resolution approving the 2017 police recruit training agreement and issuing a $36,000 payment to the Lakewood Police Department to provide law enforcement academy training for six Wheat Ridge police recruits at the combined regional academy. A motion is in order. Okay. I move to approve resolution number 24-2017, a resolution approving an agreement between the city of Wheat Ridge and the Wheat Ridge Historical Society. And I move to approve resolution number 23-2017, a resolution approving the 2017 police recruit training agreement and issuing a payment of $36,000 to the Lakewood Police Department to provide law enforcement academy training for six Wheat Ridge police recruits at the combined regional academy. Thank you. Second. Seconded by, was it? Ms. Hobby, please cast your votes. Motion carries six to zero. Thank you. We're gonna move right into item number two, Mr. Fitzgerald, if you will read that. And I believe there's probably a large sign-up sheet that, to the rear. Okay, this is a public hearing and a resolution. Uh, this is resolution 22-2017, a resolution approving a seven lot subdivision plat for property zoned residential one, R1, at 11435 West 32nd Avenue, case number WS1602, Merkwood Estates, at issue. The applicant is requesting approval of a seven lot subdivision plat for property zoned residential R1 at 11435 West 32nd Avenue. The purpose of this subdivision is to split the development parcel in accordance with the R1 zone district regulations to create seven new single family sites. Uh, prior action, the Planning Commission reviewed this request at a public hearing on June 1st, 2017, and gave a recommendation of denial for the following reason. The proposed street system and drainage design do not provide a logical development pattern for the new parcels. Thank you. 
This is a open hearing, which I've just opened, and I want to swear in anyone who will be speaking on this issue, that would include everybody who has signed up as well as staff, please stand and raise your right hand if you're going to speak, as well as the applicant if available. Thank you. Uh, do you swear to tell the whole truth as you know it to be and understand it to be? If so, say I do. Thank you. You may sit down. Prior to beginning my presentation, I do have some additional handouts that I'd like uh, to distribute for council. Um, the first one is an email that was, um, it's, a, it's a duplication of what was included in your packet from Bruce Grawl, who's the chief of the West Metro. There was one typo in the other one where he, he referenced Colfax and it should have been 32nd Avenue. So I'd like to enter that into the record. That's one thing. And then the second thing I have is a letter from Lori and Michael Strand, who live in Quail Hollow. Anyway, Quail Hollow, which is the uh, subdivision to the east. And then the final thing is a group of letters which were distributed to council via email earlier today. And so this is just a hard copy of the letters that I want to enter, in, enter into the record. And they've already received copies of those. So, for the record, I'm Meredith Record, and I'm here to present case number WS16-02, which is a request for approval of a seven-lot subdivision plat at 11435 West 32nd Avenue, and it, the property is zoned R1. Um, I'd like to enter into the record, in addition to the things I just um, entered, the case file and packet materials, the subdivision regulations, and the contents of this digital presentation. Also, all notification and posting requirements have been met, therefore City Council does have jurisdiction to hear this case. Once again, the application for being requested is for approval of a seven lot <laughs> subdivision on property zoned R1 to accommodate seven new single family homes at 11435 West 32nd Avenue. So this is a 2016 aerial of the property. North is to the top, 32nd Avenue runs um, on the southern side of the site, and you can see it outlined in red. The subject property is comprised of two parcels. One parcel sits, <clears throat> has frontage on West 32nd a Avenue and has a single family home on it and is just over an acre in size. A larger parcel, uh, which is vacant, is 3.77 acres in size, and it is essentially north of the parcel right on 32nd Avenue. There is a strip of land which extends south to 32nd Avenue, which does provide access to the site. Um, this parcel is vacant, was most, uh, most recently used for agrarian activities, and uh, the Lena Gulch 100-year floodplain does encumber the north, I'd say about uh, one-third of the site. The combined area of the two lots is 4.9 acres. This is the same 2016 aerial, except with the zoning overlay. And uh, the yellow color that you, you're seeing on the overhead represents R1 zoning. R1 zoning is the city's largest lot single family zone with 12,500 square feet of lot size with 100 feet of lot width. And as you can see from the aerial, once again, property is outlined in red. 
and that there essentially are single family homes to the, to the west developed as Applewood Brookside, which was platted in 1983, and the Primus subdivision platted in 2011. To the east is the Applewood Baptist Church parking lot on the southern end. Uh, to the north is the Quail Hollow subdivision, which was platted in 2014. Um, I would note that there is a drainage way that runs directly adjacent to the property, which is on the Applewood uh, Village, excuse me, the Applewood Baptist uh, parcel, and it is about 10, lo 10 feet lower than the surface of the parking lot. Let's take a look at some slides. So this first slide is looking west along 32nd Avenue. Um, the entrance to the property is sort of in this location. What you're seeing with the hand railing and the gutter is the overflow that um, comes across 32nd Avenue from the, the drainage basin, basin to the southwest. So this is looking straight on across uh, 32nd Avenue to the north. Again, you can see sort of in the middle of the image, uh, again, this drainage overflow flow that happens. And then just to the left of that is the existing house on the smaller piece of property. Still standing on 32nd Avenue, again, there's the house. Uh, this image was taken uh, looking into the entrance to the Applewood Brookside subdivision. That would be Route Street. And now I'm standing down at the end of the cul-de-sac bulb on Route Street looking east towards Quail Hollow. So what you're seeing is the unbuilt right-of-way at this location. This is the property being subdivided and the homes in the back are the Quail Hollow homes. Now I was standing um, on 33rd in the Quail Hollow subdivision looking uh, to the southwest and you can see uh, the rear of that existing house on the property. Looking again west, these are the homes in Applewood Brookside. And then this is looking northwest towards um, sort of the Lena Gulch area. Some of that um, property is encumbered with floodplain and then some of the houses in the back. So the subdivision we're looking at tonight is two pages. The sheet one is the declaration page, and this contains the legal description, required signature blocks for property owners, recording information, and notes. Um, the notes include language uh, that the city, city requires regarding easements and detention pond maintenance, and there's also a note regarding maintenance of common elements in the subdivision that the homeowners association would be responsible for. The second sheet it shows the layout of the subdivision. Um, north, this time, is on the left-hand side of the page. 32nd Avenue at, is at this location. Here's the Applewood Brookside subdivision, and this is Quail Hollow over here. So again, the plat will subdivide the property into seven new lots to be de developed with single-family homes. All of those lots do meet or exceed the minimum requirements for the R1 zone district. A street connection for West 33rd Avenue runs across the middle and essentially connects the Applewood Brookside subdivision with the Quail Hollow subdivision on either side. A new street comes off that 33rd Avenue called Rob Street. And I would point out that there is no vehicular connection to Rob at West 30, from Rob to West 32nd Avenue except for an, a, a pedestrian access. Um, both Rob Street and 33rd will be full with uh, dedicated local streets with public improvements installed. Lots one through six, which are in this location right here, uh, will gain access from Rob. Lot seven, which is north of 33rd Avenue, gains access uh, from 33rd. And again, I would point out that um, on lot seven, it is encumbered with 100 year floodplain, and that is an area which cannot be built on. Uh, there are easements shown on the plat. There's a pedestrian access to 32nd. There's also an emergency access turnaround provided between lots one and two. Uh, drainage and utilities uh, easements are provided along the east and west property lines of lot seven. We've got a sanitary sewer easement which um, runs along the rear portion of lot seven. And tract A, which is located right here. Whoops, let me go back, sorry. 
at this location, which will serve as a stormwater quality pond. So Applewood Brookside was platted in 1983. And as you can see, it has, again, 32nd Avenue down here, uh, Route Street extends to the north and ends in a cul-de-sac bulb. However, there was this piece of right-of-way that was dedicated but never built um, with the intent that at some point this would enable the opportunity to uh, get some better circulation area and perhaps connect with the property directly to the east. This is a copy of an exhibit that was included in that case file from 1983. I think I might have even made this using Zipatone, so that's how long ago this was. Um, 32nd Avenue is down here. This would be the Applewood Brookside subdivision with Route Street, um, showing a tentative location for Rob with a 33rd Avenue extension from Route over to Quail. Now there were some other um, connections that were shown on this exhibit as well, which included Route Street extending north up to 38th Avenue with, of course, that would take a couple of bridge crossings of Lena Gulch, and then also 35th Avenue extended um, between, I guess that's Sims and hopefully Quail on the other end. Now, um, a lot of this hasn't been uh, Come, come to fruition, but this was included in the packet with discussion about uh, future connections in the area. So, uh, more recently, this is a copy of the Quail Hollow subdivision, and north is to the, the left-hand side up here. Um, 33rd Avenue comes in from Quail Street, and it uh, goes into a, a cul-de-sac called Quail Court. Uh, 33rd Avenue continues west to hit that western boundary line. Um, so the right-of-way was dedicated and the street uh, improvements were constructed to facilitate extension of 33rd with the idea that if something uh, develops on this western side, this uh, cul-de-sac could be eliminated with these pieces vacated back to those property owners and 33rd Avenue continuing west to make that connection. So in regard to this issue of circulation, again, staff feels it's been on the city's radar screen for almost 30 years. Um, we feel that providing this connection, which again, looking at this aerial photo, here's the subject parcel, here's uh, Applewood Brookside that comes up, and uh, Quail Hollow, and so obviously you can make that visual connection, that we think that it's critical not only for connectivity for both residents, but also for emergency vehicles, and that it has been on the city's radar and screen for the last 30 years. Um, this connection would eliminate two cul-de-sac bulbs that are over 600 feet long, improve the north, south, and east, west options of the both proposed in existing neighborhoods. In addition, there, were, there are complications with connecting to 32nd Avenue. Um, we've got some offset intersections that create issues. Um, if Rob Street were to connect to 32nd, it would leave Route Street with perhaps um, double loaded lots, meaning they'd have frontage on both sides. And um, this, the complication is further exacerbated by this drainage channel which runs along the western side of the Apple Baptist lot. The south end of Rob Street is about seven feet below 32nd Avenue and would re require substantial fill to bring Rob up to that level. In addition, there might be the requirement for uh, walls to be built. Um, the city does think that a pedestrian connection is important from the subdivision to 32nd Avenue, and we have uh, designed a set of uh, of ramps that will meet the ADA standard and provide the, connect, the pedestrian connection between the new subdivision and 32nd. So um, I offer the following requirements that are listed in the subdivision design, um, the, excuse me, the subdivision regulations regarding subdivision design and connectivity, and I'm just going to paraphrase. In all subdivisions, the vehicle access and circulation shall accommodate the safe, efficient, and convenient movement of vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, and transit 
through, to, through the development as well as to and from adjacent properties and land uses. The proposed street layout shall provide for the continuation of existing planned or platted streets on the surrounding area unless the city determines that such extension is undesirable for specific reasons of topography or design. And finally, that proposed street shall be extended to the boundary of a subdivision to provide for future connection. So let's talk a little bit about the process that we've been through. Um, this is a subdivision plat application. Uh, the property is zoned R1, and the intent of a plat is to look at how land is uh, divided and developed. Uh, again, the property is zoned a, um, R1, and the proposed plat does com comply with all the minimum standards of that zone district. I would point out that a neighborhood meeting is not required for a plat if the zoning is not changed, which it isn't. Uh, we've been through our standard 15-day referral with no concerns from city departments or agencies. Obviously, there would need to be improvements made to the property in order to provide uh, water and sanitary sewer service and so on. I would point out the fire district has reviewed the plat as proposed and has um, uh, approved of the design with the turnaround feature between lots one and two. So this was reviewed by Planning Commission on June 1st of this year. Planning Commission did recommend denial for the plat, which showed the 33rd Avenue extension between Route and Quail. And um, subsequent to that Planning Commission hearing, the applicant did submit a modified plat, which has been included in your packet. And we did receive numerous letters commenting on it. I'll get to that in a minute. But let's take a look at that um, modification to the plat. So again, this was submitted to us after Planning Commission had their public hearing. And again, it looks a lot the same as before. 32nd Avenue is located down here. This is Route Street as it comes up and ends in the cul-de-sac bulb. And over here is uh, 33rd Avenue as it extends through the Quail Hollow subdivision. However, um, even though it shows the same sort of depiction with uh, the public street extending to the east to the boundary of Quail, um, it is not completed through to Route Street. West 33rd Avenue from the terminus of the existing bulb uh, would be paved over to Rob, how, however it was proposed to be gated and would allow only emergency access and pedestrian access. So essentially, the, from 33rd Avenue in Quail, you come over here and you can turn south on Rob, and again, it does not connect with 32nd Avenue, nor does it extend west to uh, Route Street. Now, staff does not support this design and has concern regarding delayed emergency vehicle response times, uh, endangering public safety for residents in the new subdivision. West Metro has commented uh, regarding fire access and have indicated concern anytime there is a gate that needs to be opened or unlocked or fiddled with, it can he can uh, exacerbate the extent of the fire. He gave us kind of a scary statistic, Bruce Crawl, that um, a fire, in one minute, a fire can double. And so by the time they come down here and fiddle to try to get the gate open and get down, it could be crucial, crucial minutes in the event of a life safety situation. I would also note that if, uh, if City Council wants to move forward with this revised plat design, that we wouldn't need a variance to the maximum cul-de-sac length. Uh, the maximum in the subdivision reg regulations is, about se is 750 feet, and this would end up being about a 1,400-foot cul-de-sac uh, situation, and we would need to um, grant a variance for that to occur. Again, we received numerous letters regarding um, Regarding the request, uh, we had a lot of them submitted as part of the plan or at the planning commission meeting before the public hearing. We received some after the planning commission meeting, and then um, we received uh, some again last week and this week. So we went ahead and sent those out, and hopefully you've had a chance to look at those. Primarily, the the concerns um, were traffic safety with the connection of 33rd. Although we also heard some comments on drainage and um, other, other issues.
staff is recommending approval for the plat version that shows the connection of 33rd Avenue between the Applewood Brookside and the Quail Hollow subdivision for the following reasons. The proposed lots meet or exceed the R1 standards. All requirements of the subdivision regulations have been met. The proposed system and drainage design provide a logical development pattern for the subdivision and also that all agencies can serve the property with improvements installed by the developer. There are four conditions of approval which have been included in your, um, in your recommended motion. And once again, if council is inclined to approve that third alternative that was brought in by the developer, then we recommend, um, we can't really continue the case, we would have to repost and re-notice it and have a new hearing for, uh, to include the variance. So that does conclude my comments and I would be happy to answer questions now. Thank you, Meredith. Council, this is your opportunity. Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, Meredith, uh, as I, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I remember from the packet, uh, there were three objections to uh, making Rob Street go through to uh, 32nd. One was the uh, disparity in, in uh, height. The, yeah, the great right. change. Right. The, the second was the offset from the street across the street. And the third was the length of the cul-de-sac. Is that correct? Um, the, the first two that you mentioned, yes, specifically. Um, um, and then I guess the, the, the third one is the, the length of the cul-de-sac that would result if we didn't have that piece that went through. Okay. What makes this different from every other street on, that, that uh, faces 32nd Avenue? Uh, I, every street that west of Kipling is offset from the Lakewood Street, except the one that we call Swadley and they call Sims. Oh, that's right. <laughs> right. So it's off, offset in name anyway. So I, I'm not sure that that would really be a difficulty. Is that, uh, is that do we have a code that that uh, prohibits that, or is that the opinion of, of uh, staff? In the subdivision regulations, it does talk about access to our higher level streets, arterials, and collectors, and discourages those. 32nd Avenue is considered an arterial and carries about 14,000 cars per day. And um, the more access is onto an arterial like that, the more, the more potential traffic conflicts in this case, we have a, a, an almost alignment. It is only off slightly. Yeah, sorry, if I could break in and answer that. Um, so offsets in general are a bad idea. When they're offset, the direction this would be where the street on the south is to the right and the street on the north is to the left, there's always a chance that when people drive up there and they're looking, they're wanting to turn left, for instance, they'll check left, they'll check right, and then they'll go. Well, someone could be across the street doing the same thing at the exact same time and they have a head-on collision in the middle of the street. That's the issue with offset streets, especially in this, in this particular direction. There are a lot of offset streets on the street, and, and in my mind, those, are, those were poorly done back in the day, and they're, 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 it's a bad design. It's just a bad design practice. And so from, our, from the staff's standpoint is, we just because it's been done before and there maybe have many accidents, doesn't, still doesn't mean it's a good idea to do it again to continue that. But we're not legally restrained, it's just a, a no, it's just, good practice. It's, it's, a, it's good design practice not to offset streets, right. particularly that close together that in, in, in right. that particular offset. If, if the street on the north side of the street was to the right a little farther, you don't have that conflict of two people turning left and running into each other at the same time. Why don't we call Lakewood and ask them to do it? Yeah, and I don't know why, you know, as, an, as a civil engineer, I've never, ever allowed that kind of design. Even when we're looking at driveways, we try to avoid having just simple driveways line up that way for, like, commercial properties and things like that. In my almost 30 years of doing this, I've tried to avoid that. We've moved things around on my site to make sure that didn't happen, for instance, when I was doing retail work. So it's just, I, I don't know why we have a plethora of those situations along the street. It was just really poor coordination between Re Re Wheat Ridge and Lakewood. Okay. It probably all happened back when it was Jefferson County. We'll just blame them for it. Right. Um, now getting to the height issue, uh, isn't it true that route has the same problem, exactly the same problem? 
Yeah, and they they filled the south end of that property to make that work. And, and the difficulty here is we've got that drainage right next door. So the way the drainage is working is the the channel and the pipe system that's along that shared property line between them and the church and then farther up to Quell Hollow conveys the minor storm event. The major storm event is flowed overland and they've designed their street to provide some of that overland flow for the 100 year event. We've made sure it won't touch the houses and all that kind of thing, but and it's something you can do. You can have streets are okay to carry major drainage. If we, if we raise the street up, now that street's gonna be above the level of drainage that would virtually require in this case underground system the whole way which becomes very cross prohibitive with seven lots um, if you tried to do something above ground you'd have to move the street to the west side of the property and then these people that are buying these new houses their entire backyard would be a drainage channel so it, it, it really degrades the quality of those lots and so that's there are a lot of reasons why the connection to, to 32nd wasn't made and again um, it's been in the city's vision for the last 30 plus years to connect these streets across and have that connection made to help distribute traffic and provide options for people that are trying to sure. turn in and out. I'm not, I'm not equating the two because sure. I, I yeah. Um, so in, in Mr. Merker's original plan, do you know when, when he first came to the city, was his plan to raise the street and uh, empty onto, Wads, onto 32nd? No, his plan was um, was not to, it's my memory, and my memory is not always great, but my memory is his plan was not to connect 32nd, it was to connect to either the west or the east street and have this just be a very, very long cul-de-sac. We said, that's a bad idea, we can't have cul-de-sacs that long. And we've designed, back in the 80s and much more recently, to have these streets connect, and that's what we want you to do. And we fought him on it for quite a while, and he finally agreed to, to make that connection and, and then build, he wanted to build this as private driveways and all those kind of things. We said, no, we, with that many houses, we need to have a public street connection. And so we worked with him for a very long time to get to where we are today. So, you, you, yeah, I'm, I'm really not understanding that issue very well because uh, by that logic, route is also a, an illegal cul-de-sac, right? Yes, which is why right. we couldn't allow it because it was much too long. And so now we're, the Rob Street plan also is an illegal uh, uh, cul-de-sac the way it stands, isn't that right? No, the way the design is currently, it's not a, a, a cul-de-sac. The cul-de-sac is just from 33rd Avenue down to the end of the street. Because now that the, if, if the connection is made from Route Street to 33rd, if 33rd is continued west to Route Street, then that's not a cul-de-sac. That actually has two ways in and out, so that's not a dead-end cul-de-sac. The only dead-end cul-de-sac is from 33rd South. If, if or from, yeah, from 33rd South on Rob Street. If Rob Street's not connected to both streets, then we do have an illegal cul-de-sac that's too long. Well, Rob, the southern part of Rob Street connects only to one street. Yes. In the plan. Is, which is right. okay, yes. And, and the cul-de-sac, the Rob Street is the cul-de-sac now because right. 33rd connects across. And that's, that doesn't exceed the 600 no, that's, feet? No, no, that doesn't exceed the 750 feet. This 750 feet, right. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Council, other questions? Okay. Madam Mayor, I have a question. Oh, do you have one? Yeah. Um, as it relates to, uh, you know, since we're talking about cul-de-sac length, you know, what is the maximum cul-de-sac length recommended by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, or what, what is it that we're sort of guiding our, our decision-making process or policy as it relates to that? Our subdivision regulations um, have a maximum of 750 feet. I don't know about the ITE I manual. I mean, we, don't, we don't regulate the ITE, that's a, that's a guidance document. We regulate our subdivision regs, which is 750 feet. Okay, and then... ITE very, very well could have a longer length, but that's not what we regulate. And then, uh, I guess my concern is it relates to um, this, uh, this potential subdivision as a... Um, there may be um, other policy recommendations from uh, institutes such as the Institute of Transportation Engineers that would have a better idea of what is plausible within um, you know the, the framework, and, and it seems like they would have a better idea of you know what is plausible versus you know, I'm not sure what what is it that we are using to limit ourselves to that 750 feet. What, what is it that we're saying we can only do 750 feet? Again, I don't know where that regulation came from. It's in our code, so that's what we regulate to. Um, you know, a lot of the thought behind having shorter cul-de-sac length is to encourage connectivity, both from a pedestrian and a vehicular standpoint, so people have options, so that 
you know, the, the Highlands West thing where they have very, very long cul-de-sacs um, in today's current thinking is not the ideal situation. Our current thinking today is sort of this new urbanism thing where we have lots more connections, people have options. Mark, isn't, isn't that a fire department? Don't they have a regulation on cul-de-sac Again, for they emergency could, They access? very well could. Fire code may have something else about cul-de-sac length, too. They would like to have no cul-de-sacs at all, ever, I'm sure, if that was their choice. But, but again, we regulate our subdivision regulations, and that's what we, we didn't go search what, what other people regulate to because sure. we're regulating what we have. But, but also I think that the, the fire code would also permit uh, a different type of uh, uh, building uh, mechanism through either sprinklers or otherwise, depending on the length of the uh, cul-de-sac as well, depending on uh, what that length is. So there's also some considerations in that regard as well. So uh, I'm not suggesting that sprinklers are a necessity in this regard, but uh, I think that there is some... Uh, parameters around that so I, I don't think that we need to necessarily say that we're doing this just because it, this is the way it's always been we need to un understand why it is we have this regulation and uh, go with that you know as it relates to new urbanism I, I don't think that that's necessarily what this neighborhood is uh, is about and uh, I don't think that's the character of this uh, particular neighborhood or what this neighborhood is going to look like at any time in the, in the near future or uh, what these neighbors are are bought their properties for and would want to uh, seek in the near future. So um, that that would concern me if that's the vision uh, for this neighborhood. I, I don't see that uh, being uh, something that I would be in favor of. May I ask a question? The access to the to Rob Street, which will be the basically a new street, a full width street. The access egress to it is is that. <clears throat> then the only access egress to it is off 33rd Avenue. That's what you're thinking of? That's what? Yes. Okay. There, the vehicular access off this new connection of 33rd Avenue. We did just so that someone that lives at the south end didn't have to walk all the way around. If they wanted to, for instance, walk to Applewood Shopping Center, we did require them to do a pedestrian access that has a series of ramps to get up the five-foot grade. We did a pedestrian connection to 32nd Avenue because that again is something that just goes to the sidewalk and now people can, can walk up there and they can walk to the church or they can walk down to Applewood Shopping Center either way. Has there have been a thought at all about not connecting up, not connecting 33rd Avenue all the way to Route Street, but instead connect it only to uh, basically 33rd Avenue that goes to Quail Court, leaving Route Street with that yeah, but again, now the, now the cul-de-sac, because the nearest connecting street is Quail Street, the cul-de-sac is now all of 33rd and then all of Rob, which gets it up around um, round numbers 1,500 feet, which it greatly exceeds our 750 foot threshold. Why would you have to have a cul-de-sac at the end of 33rd? So, so you know, you would, but, but so, if, so if, we, if we extend 33rd to the end of this subdivision and straight south is Rob Street, our mm -hmm. cul-de-sac now starts back at Quail. Because okay. there's not another street that connects. So the cul-de-sac is now from Quail all the way down to the very end of the, the new Rob Street. By making the connection across, because there's two streets, if, you know, if, if something right. happens where there's something going on on Route Street where the fire truck can't get there, they can run around to Quail and get into the subdivision, or vice versa. That's the point of having the connecting streets. Okay. That way the cul-de-sac is just Rob Street only, which is 600 or so feet long. Okay, I understand. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. All right. I believe um, it's time. Is the applicant wish to make any statement? Sir, please come and introduce yourself. And you did swear in. Hello, my name is uh, Steve Merker, the uh, applicant for the Merkwood Estates Project. And uh, I suppose I, I gave a little of the background the last time, and I've been trying to work with some of the neighbors and with the city, and I'm in sort of a difficult position because I work, I live, and I build inside the city. So this is not my only project with city staff, and we've worked diligently to sort of work through the issues that have come up on this project. And I've sort of, I was, initially opposed uh, <laughs> vehemently so as mark had pointed out uh, to the connection between 30 between 33rd and route street uh, because the original vision for this site was that it was a long complex uh, 
parcel with a lot of grade challenges and a lot of drainage that went through it. So it was a very, very difficult site to develop. And had I not bought the, the house to, this, to the, the 11435, it would virtually have been impossible to develop. So working with the city staff, the connectivity issue came up time and time and time and time again. Uh, must have been three or four iterations that we went through. And we came up with an iteration where we finally got to this point. And it's been about a year and a half to get to this meeting where I'm you know, being introduced to everybody. So the difficulty is that I, I, I want to take into consideration all the neighbors uh, because I want to live here myself. I want to take into consideration the city staff because I, they're very capable, smart people. And so I'm, I'm literally stuck between two forces where I want to please everybody. And, uh, and there are trade-offs to both. So we have some alternative recommendations. One of them is the gate. Uh, one of them is uh, to, to what Mark had just pointed out is 30, I'm sorry, what, uh, what you, Ms. Jay, just pointed out was going in 33rd, taking a left uh, right here and then coming down. As I understand, that presents some other challenges that would have to be worked through. So I, I'm trying to get clarity from, from council, from the neighbors and from staff. And, and I, I just want this project to move forward in the best way possible for everybody to be happy. And, 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 and I think that there are some alternatives that could work, but I also think that this one could work. And so I, I'm, I'm literally left in a very difficult position here. So I, I, I don't know if that helps or hurts or complicates the situation, but it's, it's the position that I've been put in. And, and I'm, I'm, I just wanna do a good job for the project and for the site and, and, and develop this in accordance to the the vision that I know this could be a great place. So that, that would be my remarks. If anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Ms. Hobby. Thanks for coming in this evening. Um, we understand that staff's recommendation is to not connect to 32nd Avenue. What is your opinion on that? I, I, I would be very opposed to connecting 32nd Avenue to Rob Street uh, for a lot of reasons. The, the amount of fill and drainage challenge that come up by, by connecting from 32nd into the Rob Street. And you know if we just basically took Rob Street from here and then connected all the way to 32nd, would mean that all of these lots would now be brought up and it would be a giant watershed from this. So it, it, it makes these houses, in my opinion, very, at risk for the 168 acres of watershed that come through this property. Uh, th there are also a variety of reasons. This is almost 10 feet or seven feet between 32nd and right here. So bringing it up is, you've, you've got to, you, you now are driving uphill to take a left hand, to, you can't see over your steering, you're just at a very high angle to make that come out would mean that that thing would have to be, that the grade alone, you're talking about a tremendous amount of fill. I don't, have, I don't know where you get that amount of fill. Is it possible? Yes, everything is possible with time and money. That, that's not something you have with seven lots. You don't have time, you don't have money. This is a very small subdivision uh, to, to, to bring in that type of resource. I don't have those resources. Thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, we can now move on to public testimony. I have many names here. We usually ask that you keep to three minutes on your testimony. I'm also gonna ask that if somebody has said something a great deal before, maybe you could say same as or I agree with or whatever so that um, everybody has a chance to be heard. The other thing that we always ask is not to have any applauding or hooting or whatever, because sometimes that makes others sensitive about speaking themselves, and we all do want to hear all of you as well as our council does. So I'm going to start with public testimony with Dr. Uh, Schmidke. I don't know if I messed that up, but, and please come and give your name 
Spell your last name for the clerk as well as your address. Good evening. I'm Dr. Gil Schmidtke, S-C-H-M-I-D-T-K-E. I live at 11305 West 33rd Avenue, um, on the bubble, so to speak. If you look at 33rd Street and you see the little aneurysm there, I am right next to, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so I'm on the aneurysm and I'm the closest neighbor to the project. And I'm anxious to have some nice homes built there. We are new to Colorado and new to Wheat Ridge. When we surveyed where we wanted to live, we noticed the neat neighborhoods that Wheat Ridge has, small communities. And, and that's kind of neat. And we are trying to do the same thing in Quail Hollow. We've already had parties and trying to become a community. Um, now, I totally understand Route Street saying we have a community there. We have a street. And I can understand why they're concerned about 33rd Avenue connecting with it and becoming not a neighborhood, but a thoroughfare. And I feel the same thing will happen to 33rd Street. Now, I understand the issues that you're facing, trying to make uh, egress from the school easier for people that drive their children to school. But I don't think you need to hurt another neighborhood to do that, to help people at the school. Nor do I think that we need to have more traffic. I, I think it seems so practical to take our 12 homes and combine it with six or seven homes that he's proposing, and now we have another neighborhood. Maybe the 750 feet or something is an issue, but what I'm saying is that it does make some sense. 33rd could certainly be, can accommodate seven more homes. Could it handle all the traffic from the school? I'm not sure. But those people that have been living with that, they came to that school with that in mind, and they know that. Um, Route Street, by the way, we walk it all the time. Boy, even with the pool there, the traffic can be very difficult getting out of Route Street. So connecting 33rd to Route, I don't see how that's, a, I, don't, I don't see how that makes things safer. But as the closest neighbor to this development, I would welcome connection. He's got to get in and out. I don't see 32nd, getting on 32nd from there. But 33rd Street would be a practical and to me, as the closest neighbor, an acceptable alternative. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Ross Casados, Casados, and then Peggy Nielsen. Maybe you could get ready if Peggy would be lined up and available. Good evening. My name is Ross Casados, C-A-S-A-D-O-S. I live at 3291 Route Street. I'm here tonight because I'm having surgery tomorrow, so I want to make sure that you understand how important this is to me and my community on Route Street. I have raised my children for 27 years in that cul-de-sac. I a, picked the cul-de-sac because it's quiet. I don't know how many of you live in a cul-de-sac, and I'm sure you would appreciate it as opposed to a third street. My kids are growing up now, and I have grandchildren. And the problem I have now is that I have challenged grandchildren who love to play on the street. If you do a thorough way through there from the school or whatever, you're going to endanger my grandchildren. It's going to become a very busy street. If you're traveling south, it's an uphill battle. And during the winter time, we are lucky to be able to get out from route onto 32nd Street. If you double and triple that with the school people doing that, it's going to be even worse. I've already expressed a lot of this. I don't have a problem with Mr. Merkel building his houses there, but I don't see the feasibility or the logic connecting 33rd Street all the way to Route. 
time that I've spent there, the fire engines that have responded to my neighbor's house have qu been quite a few in the last year. They have no trouble with their fire engines or the police cars getting in there and out. Why they need another access point, I guess I just don't get that from, from you guys there. But I just want to stress to you that I am really concerned about my challenged grandchildren playing in the street with cars leaving the school at a deadly rate, trying to get home or for whatever reason. I also understand that in the future, you can correct me, I'm sure you will, about 32nd Street being a thoroughway from Golden when they build the new center out there. It's going to use 32nd to go all the way to downtown, which is increasing the traffic. Again, I've loved living in this cul-de-sac for 27 years, and I hope that you won't disturb that for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peggy Nielsen followed by Jeff Nielsen, and then Doug Fisher. Jeff, could you, could you be standing, waiting in line? Hello, my name is Peggy Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N. I live at 3281 Route Street. And um, I don't have a prepared speech, but I just want to clarify again, I'm a little frustrated that the information uh, put forth from the city does not even address the traffic from uh, Prospect Valley School, which would be a huge issue for us. Um, and again, I just feel I don't understand why there's a need to create this new neighborhood at the expense of those of us who live on Route Street. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Jeff followed by Doug Fisher, or Flasher, I believe, Fisher. My name is Jeff Nielsen, 3281 Route Street. I want to just reiterate what my wife said regarding traffic from the school. Because we do feel, due to the large open enrollment at that school, that there will be a lot of traffic in the morning and in the afternoons. I want to agree with what people have said previously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so brief. I'm Doug Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R, 3220 Route Street. And I, like the rest, most folks here, are totally against cutting 33, 33rd Avenue through the route. But I want to talk about a different issue, which hasn't really been addressed yet. And that's the issue of the neighborhood culture, the neighborhood um, as it stands. Um, Merkwood is proposing s seven home sites on 4.9 acres. On the surface, that seems pretty reasonable. But if you take a closer look at it, you'll see that six of those homes are crammed onto half of that uh, parcel on the south side between 33rd and 32nd. Now, according to um, what I've gathered from the uh, Markwood folks, they plan on putting a mix of uh, two-story homes on these six parcels, maybe seven parcels. And they plan on selling these homes for around $1.2 million. Now, if you can imagine, those are huge homes. And they're, they're just very tiny lots these six homes would back up to the five homes on, uh, um, on Route Street. The five homes on Route Street are s all with the exception of one home, single level ranch style homes. They plan on cramming these huge two story homes with limited setback right up against these five homes. That's gonna change the culture that's going to rob the current residents on Route Street of any backyard privacy whatsoever. All the homes in Quail Hollow are ranch-style homes. 
and all, as I said, all but one of the homes along the east side of route are, are, are ranch style homes. It's just not a good idea. There's nobody living in the neighborhood who thinks cutting 33rd th through to route is a good idea. And there's also nobody who lives in the neighborhood who thinks the currently proposed development plan is a good idea. It would change the culture of the whole neighborhood. The folks who are for this development are the developers who would get, who would make tons of money at our expense. So I'm asking you to vote against this proposal as designed. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. David Hay, followed by Rebecca, and then Dwayne Chesley. Or, I think that's what it is. My name is David Hay, H-A-Y. I live at 3280 Route Street. We bought our home five years ago because it was on a cul-de-sac and it was quiet. And like many here, I opposed having 33rd come through with or without a gate. As has been expressed before, I'm worried about the traffic from the school and those who used its facilities. And with the gate, like you can make that connection with a knockdown traffic barrier like we've seen all over the Clear Creek Path. I feel like there should be, there's a, a way to do emergency access needed. Maybe you put the gate at 33rd, at 32nd Avenue at the end of Rob Street. They got semis in and out of there without any trouble to dump dirt. Why can't they get a fire engine in? We bought the house. We knew about the right of way to the property behind us, but our understanding was that it was just to access the property behind us because it was two properties at the time. We wouldn't be able to get a proper driveway in from 32nd. The diagram shown today was the first time I'd ever seen any plans that suggested 30 through 3rd Avenue would ever go through. 2007, the original Quail, Hall, a Quail Hollow plat was provided that didn't have a 33rd Avenue go through, and there was no mention of changing it to make it that way. So it seems that nobody wants this connection. Residents don't want it. Mr. Merker didn't want it. Until recently, the city didn't want it. So why do it now? The Wheat Ridge Comprehensive Plan talks over and over about the desire to work with neighborhoods, maintain character, and maintain property values. Quote, the city will continue to work with neighborhoods to focus on improving stability, home ownership, property values, significant, protecting significant views, and provide high quality infill in established neighborhoods. The city has not worked with us. In over the year and a half, we've never been consulted. We didn't even know there was a new plan until last Thursday when we looked at the packet. So we, there's a lot of unknowns. So I ask you tonight to please reject this application. Thank you. Thank you, David, Rebecca, and then Dwayne Chesley. <clears throat> Dwayne, could you be ready? Thank you, Dwayne. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Hay of 3280 Route Street. Um, I have two, two points I'd like to make. I, again, would like to express concern over the elevation. Our home is at 3280 route, which is one of the lowest ones in the cul-de-sac. We have um, been informed by, by, through conversations with the Kirkwood <coughs> that they would likely want to have out, uh, walkout basements and then the homes would be two stories and that they would be build, built at a higher elevation than our current home. So I am concerned as the previous um, person mentioned about the new homes looming over mine but I am mainly concerned about the drainage from these six homes on the south part of the plat. We spent a lot of time at the planning meeting earlier in the month talking about the drainage and how that would go over the Applewood Baptist property, but no mention was made of the um, amount of water collected from this new roofs from these six homes and how that would be handled. Um, 
if the homes were to be built at a higher elevation, I don't understand how the runoff from that would be handled, and I don't want to see it all in my basement. Um, and I would like to encourage that the developer would, would be required to submit drawings and renderings similar to those that were submitted for Quail Hollow. I believe that they are not required to due to the size of the subdivision, but in the filings for Quail Hollow, you can see designs of the homes and the renderings of the elevation. Again, I do not think it's acceptable. The proposed plan of an emergency gate and a pedestrian walkway connecting Route 233rd. There is no guarantee that the city will not just come and, it, and remove the gate at a later time. And to me, this seems of, to be a weak attempt at mildly appeasing the uh, neighborhood objections in a way to get the developer um, what he's looking for. And looking at recent documents, uh, the development of Fireside at Apple, Applewood, which is the new subdivision that was put in um, just east of the Color Strand on 38th there, that has about 52 homes in it. Um, it seems that the um, cul-de-sac there is, is very long. There is only one access point into there. But what they have done is they have a gate that goes from um, one, of the red, it, one of the streets out onto 38th, which I believe to be a busier street than 32nd. That would be my guess. And it, it is lock, a locked gate. It looks like a regular driveway, but there is a locked gate with a dedicated lock on it for the fire department. So I guess one of the questions I would have is how come that subdivision was allowed to come through? It's basically a big O, but there's only one way in and out. And I would have some of the many same concerns that have been um, proposed here. So similarly, the subdivision behind the rec center, the Cambridge Park, has a similar thing. There you have a gated, a security gate with a, a great big O, and there appears to be some sort of service entrance at about 39th and Miller. That gate is unlocked. It's a double gate, so a very large vehicle, or probably two very large vehicles could pass. I would like to propose that the city consider leaving Route Street alone, making the 33rd um, go up to uh, Rob Street and consider if a similar gate to the ones in Fireside at Applewood or Cambridge Park could be put at the top of 32nd and Rob Street to allow the emergency access that the uh, city keeps bringing up as the reason for needing um, to poke into Route Street. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Dwayne, and then Danielle? My name is Dwayne Chesley, C-H-E-S-L-E-Y. I live at 3261 Route Street. I've lived in Wheat Ridge 55 years and rarely have a, had the need to come before council, but this is one issue that demands my attention, certainly. As I sent uh, each of you an email, uh, explaining my situation, the connection between Quail and Route uh, as a street makes no sense. It would only degrade the quality of three neighborhoods, Quail Hollow, Route Street, and then the soon to be developed Rob Street. Uh, a gate uh, possibility, uh, like it's been said, uh, a lock gate is not always going to be a lock gate. So I'm very much opposed to a through street there for obvious reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Danielle and then Anthony Marcello. I'm Danielle Marcello, M A R C E L L O. I live at 3241 Brown Street. My parents built their dream house on a quiet cul de sac to raise their three children, me being one of them. My, my mom is very proud that she has been a Wheat Ridge resident her whole life and she gradu graduated from Wheat Ridge High School. Um, I loved growing up in the cul-de-sac. We all take very good care of our homes in the neighborhood and the neighbors care about each other. It is proven that crime, crime rate is higher on through streets. Ch children are less likely to play outside and our homes will be devalued by 20 to 29%. Um, why is a road that, why is this road so important when it will benefit no one and harm many? 
Obviously a gate is better than a through street, but we would need some assurance that the gate could not be removed or just left open later. Is it in the city council's power to assure us of that? Or can the planning department and city council ask the builders to design some alternative that would prevent 33rd from becoming a busy through street? That sounds like what the builders want as well. Maybe Route Street should be left a cul-de-sac and save everyone the costs. I am fearful that the planning department will keep coming back with 33rd as a through street over and over again. We hope the planning department and the city council can come to some agreement that will cause less, less trauma to our three neighborhoods. We need to have faith and trust in our government to not cause three neighborhoods to become less than they are and can. I feel my parents have been extremely traumatized by this whole event. It's literally been the center of their lives for the past three weeks. Um, the neighborhood has been unnecessarily harassed for a road that seems to have no real purpose. Um, in regard to the offset street, why would you run 100, 125 more cars four times a day from Prospect Valley up to an off, offset street that um, an engineer says is extremely dangerous? Route and the new Rob have the same offset, so it is dangerous to open 33rd, off, 33rd up for the Prospect Valley cars to take. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Anthony, and then David Moss. Good evening. My name's Anthony Marcello, and I reside at 3241 Route Street, uh, right there on uh, my daughter, Danielle, and my wife, Lori. So, um, first of all, I, I just want to go uh, through a couple other points here. Um, I was just wondering, with the hammerhead turnaround for the emergency vehicles, uh, Mr. Engineer, did what is the design vehicle for West Metro that you did the turning templates on to make sure that, that the fire vehicles can navigate in that hammerhead and back out? You didn't, we haven't checked that to make sure that that's big enough? Oh, okay. I would just like to know because I, I dealt with that recently and we had to use their design vehicle to make sure it worked. Um, and then uh, the, the whole argument, um, and I have the Wheat Ridge regulations here, and it says the center of the cul-de-sac bulb shall not be longer than 750 feet from the center line of the intersecting street. So the intersecting street, if you read this verbatim, it doesn't say the intersecting through street. It just says the intersecting street. And Rob Street would be within 750 feet of the intersecting street. Furthermore, we're not setting a precedence if we did just make the 33rd over to Rob connection and not even mess with Route Street. We wouldn't be setting any new precedences. I don't know if I'm allowed. Can I give a handout yes. to, to everybody? Yes. Council, yes. To please Council. give it to the clerk. If, if, you, if you could, please. I would just like to go through a few things, uh, a few points and that, that haven't been uh, necessarily discussed yet. Uh, the maps are compliments of Google Earth, but I made some uh, uh, edits to them for clarity purposes. Once everybody gets them. I'll, I'll run through this very quick. I appreciate everybody's patience. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> All right. If we start on the first sheet that says connectivity at the top, um, there's been a lot of talk about connectivity. Well, 33rd, really, all it connects is Quail to Route Street. And there would be no out of weight. Why would people leave 32nd to connect to something there unless you live in that neighborhood? Even the Pearson Street, uh, Quail Street, is, is currently a U. Those people wouldn't even, that doesn't connect them to anything except more residential streets. If they're leaving to get out to go up uh, 32nd, which I think is a major collector, I'm not sure if it's an arterial or not. I, I thought the last time I checked it was a major collector, but regardless, um, it doesn't really connect anything east of Pearson or west of Route Street. So connectivity means that you're, you're reducing travel times for people. Well, actually, if all the residents in this area utilize 33rd, they'd be increasing their travel times. So in this case, connectivity really does not apply. If you, if you flip over to the next sheet that says connectivity, again, it's a much bigger map. Lena Gulch through this area inherently just bisects the whole area, and that, that's why it was designed kind of the way it does, the way it is. Precedent's been set. 
Sim Street does not go through. Now that would provide connectivity. The only connectivity between 38th and 32nd right now is Ward and almost a half a mile east is Parfait. Nothing connects those in the center, but by your argument with the vision, you know, their Sims could have been connected. 35th uh, and Tabor could have been connected. Union Street going. You see all these other connections that weren't ever made. That now that's true connectivity because that neighborhood that comes down Tabor to 35th or, or Sims to 35th there, they have to go all the way back out to 38th to go like up to King Supers. Whereas if that connection would have been made at those two cul de sacs, they could have then proceeded and with no out of direction travel to get to King Supers. That's what people mean by connectivity. That's what connectivity is. The benefit of the greater good to reduce travel times. Nobody's gonna detour off 32nd to take 33rd and improve connectivity. It just doesn't make sense. So if you flip to the next page, it says cul-de-sacs and you can kind of see the yellow there. I've highlighted 23 cul-de-sacs just between Ward Road and Parfait Street. And again, there's so many of those because Lena Gold's bisects right through the area. Cul-de-sacs are not new in this, in this area. There's 23 of them, and I just wanted to highlight all of those. Now, if you go to the next page, I, I'm showing here on 35th Street. See, 35th was never connected except with a pedestrian walkway, which me and my wife frequently walk our dog. We walk over to the park and everything there. Pedestrian connectivity is fabulous for Wheat Ridge. So many people walk their dogs and enjoy that park. But I just highlighted from the nearest intersecting street. So we have a current condition of 845, which is greater than the 750. Uh, uh, Sim Street is 1125, 1125 feet to a dead end. Um, Route Street 645, which is under the 750. Um, if you go to the next, next sheet over, I, I just wanted to show that blow up of that area. Now on West 35th, if you look at that eastern bulb, and I know I just said it was, what, uh, 845 feet to that first intersecting street, but that's a cul-de-sac. The one above that's a cul-de-sac. You have to go literally a quarter of a mile, 1,400 and some feet, to get to 38th Avenue. So we've set precedents already. You know, this, this by doing this with Merkwood from 33rd just up to the end of theirs, doesn't set a precedence in Wheat Ridge. The precedent's already been set. This, 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 this is evidently done here all the time. The emergency response, connecting route would be no value. West Metro would respond to Parfait Street. That's the quickest one. Why would they bypass Quail to go to Route Street to come back east and up Rob Street? They wouldn't. They'd come up Quail Street, come down to, or uh, come up Parfait to 32nd to Quail and over. That would be their quickest route anyway. So I don't, I don't feel how the, the response times would be any different. As a matter of fact, I don't think anybody would use the route. I, I, don't, I don't believe that that argument's really something that, that carries a lot of weight on this. And then the last page is showing it would be 930 feet just from the nearest intersecting street where I highlighted from yellow. If you just made that one connection uh, and not punched it through, just made the connection to Rob Street. From the end of the bulb, it's a lot less. It's even less than the 750 feet. But from the nearest intersecting street, which is what this says, it's 930 feet, which is well within the realm of everything else in Wheat Ridge. So, and I know I'm going over my time, and I, I, I sincerely appreciate your, your patience. But I just want to read one thing. And if I may, Mayor, I'd like to quote you that, that, that we would just say that uh, we must find ways to hold on to the uniqueness of our city. And that's what we want to do. Wheat Ridge is a wonderful place. We've raised three beautiful kids here. All these people have raised families. We love Wheat Ridge. We just want to keep the uniqueness of our city. So thank you was very that much a, for Was that time. a quote from me? It was. Oh, that, that was good. Yes. <laughs> right here in your, I read the little flyers, yeah. so I get good information in there. But Wheat Ridge is great, and we want to keep it that way. So we are opposed to 33rd all the way through. Thank, I am. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. David Moss. And then Matt Glover, it looks like. Good evening, I'm Dave Moss, uh, MOSS. I live at 3221 Route Street. And, uh, you know, I, I concur with uh, all of my neighbors. We, we don't want to see any property devaluation because we become a through street. 
one of my observations is the fact that there was a lot of, of uh, talk in the proposal about the fact that uh, West Metro Fire would have extended uh, response times if 33rd wasn't cut all the way through to Route Street and the fact that it would make a, I believe it was a 1,400 foot cul-de-sac. Really, in all honesty, no matter how you look at it, Rob Street is going to be a 1,400 foot cul-de-sac. It doesn't matter whether you're coming from Route Street or whether you're coming from Quail Street. It ends up being a 1,400 foot cul-de-sac. Closest fire station, as you all know, is the one over at uh, 38th Avenue. They're not gonna come to Route Street to respond. They'll, co they'll go down Quail. As, a, uh, as an alternative, they've also got uh, Pearson Street that they can use. One of the neighbors mentioned the fact that uh, you know their their kids play on the street all the time. Uh, just yesterday, I was uh, standing at my kitchen sink, and and our kitchen happens to look right out onto Route Street. And uh, I was observing one of the uh, neighbor neighborhood uh, children uh, riding down the street, down the middle of the street on her skateboard. Is that is that safe? No. Is it what all kids do? Yes. And she was riding down the street on her skateboard. And about five seconds behind her as she started down our street, I observed one of our other neighbors pull down the street in their pickup truck. And he slowed down and, and just crawled down our street to allow her safe passage on her skateboard. If we had 33rd Avenue cut through and we had all these parents picking, and, picking up and dropping off their children from the elementary school, I can see those parents being in a rush you know, rounding that corner down at the bottom of 33rd and route and, you know, not, not carrying a hoot whether there's any kids out there playing there in a hurry to get home and do their, their evening business or, or get to work and, and uh, take care of that. So I, I don't think that there's any, any upside to building 33rd Avenue all the way to Route Street. Um, and again, uh, one of the neighbors mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, we have a hard time getting out of Route Street in the wintertime. And if you shunt half of the, the drivers from the elementary school up our street, they're just going to turn it into an ice rink. You know, it'll, it'll make it impossible for not only the people that live there, but also the uh, parents dropping their children off. That's Thank you, Matt. Or you're David, sorry. No, I, next is Matt. I checked off the wrong one here. Matt, and then followed by Carlos. My name is Matt Glover. I, I live at 11355 West 33rd Avenue, right next to the development. I'd like to say first that I'm not unsympathetic with the developer. I've been through this process myself, and it takes time. I also realize that uh, we all don't get everything we want in a deal. Um, there has to be a little bit of something in it for all of us. I've strongly felt from the very beginning that the access to this property should have been off of 32nd. Um, you would leave two cul-de-sac communities intact. I realize it presents challenges. However, I've been in the construction business since uh, 1978, so I'm used to challenges. Now, one thing that the two neighborhoods agree on is that we don't, either one of us want a through street. Um, I'm not going to be so presumptuous as to tell you how you should decide, but I will tell you I have concerns. If 33rd were to be connected, what would happen to our bubble cul-de-sac that is in front of uh, our houses right now. Um, what would that look like? Who would be responsible for that? I'm also concerned about the construction traffic that would come down 33rd during school time and every other time, and the damage to our new roads, because we do have a new subdivision. I'm concerned about the safety of the, the kids that are, if you've ever been up there when they get out of school, they're running everywhere. 
I'm concerned about um, cars driving too fast and the and the kids the children in, the, in our neighborhood so you have a very very difficult decision to make and I understand that um, on the one hand you got a developer trying to get his project done on the other hand you have two neighborhoods that want to retain their independence and their cul-de-sac communities and I think there's a way to mitigate it and I think in my personal opinion it's coming off of 32nd thank you thank you thank you <clears throat> Charles Fawcett or Carlos and Ray Archer would you please be ready good evening uh, my name is Carlos Fawcett that's F-A-W-C-E-T-T I live at 3240 Route Street. Um, we are opposed to the connection of Route and 33rd as well um, for many reasons. I'll keep it short. Um, you're taking a cul-de-sac community of 25 plus years and giving the benefit to a brand new subdivision. Um, we, for the last 13 years, we're new to um, Route Street. We've only been there for about a year, um, but for the last 13 years lived in Denver County just off of 37th and Tejon. And the development over there is, is great, it's amazing, we were happy it came, however it did bring um, a lot of traffic through our street. Um, one of the reasons why we liked um, Route is because it is a cul-de-sac community. Um, they're great neighbors, everybody cares about each other and takes care of their property. Um, it's gonna destroy that 25-year um, um, community, I believe. Um, it's a community that's been around for a very long time and it seems like a great community. Um, it doesn't approve anyone's safety, um, the community, nor the value of anyone's property. In fact, it just seems like it's going to decrease safety, community, and the value of everyone's home. Um, it's unsafe to have, if it's unsafe to have the new Mark, Markwood subdivision um, connect to 32nd, then it's also unsafe to increase traffic from route onto 32nd. Um, I feel that connecting six homes to 33rd doesn't create an undue hardship on Quail Hollow, but connecting Quail Hollow and Markwood to route does create a hardship and devalues all homes on Route Street. So we are um, opposed to this connection as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ray Archer followed by Lori Marcello. We've heard that name before. My name is Raymond Archer and I live at 3130 Union Street. Last name spelled A-R-C-H-E-R. -E and Union Street, of course, is in Lakewood, but I really feel I'm part of more than Lakewood because I was one of the developers of this property, Applewood Brookside, in the 80s with my dad. He had a builder's license built in the community for starting in the 50s until he passed in 96. And I built with him for about 10 years. Um, also, all four of my, well, four of my five kids went to Wheatridge High School. Currently, I have three grandkids at Prospect Valley. And, well, my wife taught at Prospect Valley 14 years, special needs kids. So, to Weedridge. Plus, I have a son living in Applewood Brookside now in the house that my dad built for himself. The reason, a builder, he could build his own house anywhere. He chose this subdivision to build his house in retirement for this is the same reason that many of the people have already told you. And several of those are buyers that we built for. I just wanted to address a little bit. Well, one thing sticks in my craw, and, and that's calling this illegal cul-de-sac. It's 675 feet, I believe. The regulations are 750. So I, I think route is legal. I could be wrong. Um, the dedication for 33rd and it came about, we had our subdivision plat drawn, ready for submittal, and Consolidated Mutual turned us down because it would be a dead end water main. And a man named Wally Welton, he wasn't chairman back then, but he was the engineer on this case, worked with me and we agreed to do a builder, bigger pipe, put in another um, fire hydrant with a T and give him an easement where a 33rd would be so we could turn it ultimately and go up to 32nd. That was the whole deal. So I went discussed it with staff and it was going to be a 20-foot utility easement and one thing led to another and um, Perry, Ralph Perry and his wife talked with us 
Ralph did, and said, if you're going to do that, why don't you make it big enough so that I can have access to my property? Um, but it was originally so that future subdivisions could turn that dead end water main into a back to 30 seconds. That was the original. Now I, I understand why planning staff would want to connect it, probably, but it really doesn't benefit anybody. There's no more land to develop down there. So some of the other proposals would probably work. Um, I drive kids, my grandkids, twice a week to uh, Prospect. Three of them, well, one on to Manning, so it's two. And that traffic pattern is not for the faint of heart, <laughs> getting in and out of there. And I can just see, and I would do the same thing if, if my friends and the people we built for didn't live on route. I would just come straight out of the Prospect's parking lot all the way down the route and turn left. And that would work, except on rainy days and snowy days when nobody can get out the route because it is almost a 5% grade. So, you know, I'm very pro-development. I think that would be a nice place to end the development in that area. But you've got to figure out something about that traffic. Thank you. Thank you much for Thank that history. Thank you, Ray. Laurie, and um, once again, if, you've, if we've already, maybe you could, uh, We've already heard that the, <laughs> and I do have she's, she's going to give us something different. Sorry. And then Stephen Archer. Okay. Um, I, uh, my name is Lori Marcello, M-A-R-C-E-L-L-O. We built our home. 27 years ago at 3241 Route Street. Um, I spoke to Debbie Perry on Saturday. She is the previous landowner who sold the property to Mirkwood Construction. She asked me to convey the following message. She's approved this and all of her information for contact is at the bottom of this. You can call her or email her to confirm it. She said that Mirkwood's original plans were quite different than what is being presented now. Debbie was excited to sell to Mirkwood because they wanted to put in several net zero environment friendly homes on a private street and thought this would be a pleasant compliment to the area. But apparently Mirkwood Construction was told by the city planning department that they needed to make 33rd a through street in order for the city to approve their development. So instead of something special, this had to be redesigned with a through street. There's obviously other alternatives. The Perrys bought the property in the late 70s, and the property was surrounded by five-acre undeveloped parcels. She was undeniably certain that in the 1980s, there was absolutely no plans for any through street on her property. Why would they arbitrarily put roads through undeveloped fields? If there was a road, the house they planned to build would have been right smack in the middle of that road. She remembers that some of the neighbors um, from Applewood Brooks, um, excuse me, from Applewood Brookside had contacted the city to vacate the right-of-way. She asked us to leave the right-of-way open so that their property would not become landlocked. The city then contacted the owner at the end of the cul-de-sac and asked them to maintain the right-of-way for the Perry's landlocked property. That's item one, which is also exhibit five that they've been using as an example of a through street. Through the years, she has seen plans for all the adjacent properties, including Applewood Baptist Church, and never once has there been plans for 33rd being a through street. There were no plans for 33rd as a through street in the 2007 city-approved Quail Hollow development, see items two and three. She feels that 33rd is unnecessary and unbeneficial to anyone in the area. It devalues the existing homes and creates a less safe environment. The homeowners in Applewood Brookside always knew of this right away, but it was only to give her access to her landlocked property and certainly was never meant to be a through street. She said she thinks the city was aware of this as well. Also, the 2007 approved Quail Hollow Minutes, see item four, says staff has concluded that granting of the variance for this longer cul-de-sac would not alter the character of the area. There are several cul-de-sacs serving subdivisions in the vicinity, which exceed 500 feet. The Applewood Brookside subdivision to the west, where Route Street is 675 feet long and was platted in 1983. Also, Steve McKendry's city letter of approval, item number three, 
emphasizes that a cul-de-sac configuration allows the subdivision to be developed in a way which is environmentally sensitive and less impactive to the residents. Her last point was this. The city allowed a one-street access road to the Quail Hollow development and, and was all approved and built. Now the plans would extend that road by just one block more for the emergency equipment. Mirkwood builders are asking for the exact same one-street access consideration that Quail Hollow was allowed and are being denied. Again, this is Debbie Perry's contact information. She said you are free to call her with any questions. I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions about the attachments, you can ask me afterwards. Thank you very much. Stephen or Stephen Archer, followed by, followed by Michelle Hillian. Hillian. Hello. Stephen Archer. Oh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, last name A R C H E R. I live at 3260 Route Street. Um, I had quite a few things prepared, but my um, neighbors have brought most of, not all of them up. Um, the only thing I'd like to read is, is to um, please look at the section marked area traffic circulation in page three of the agenda. The third paragraph under area traffic circulation stating that 33rd has clearly been the city's intent to provide this street connection since the early 80s has proven to be incorrect. By several plat maps, by Ray Archer, my father, as he just spoke, um, the Applewood Brookside Builder Statement and Debbie Perry Statement, as Lori just said. Um, also, it is not on the 2007 approved Quail Hollow Plat, which ends in a cul-de-sac. Um, as you can tell, I'm opposed to 33rd going through, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Michelle Hilliam. Help me I'm, with that. I'm Michelle Hillam, H-I-L-L-A-M. Okay. I'm at 3310 Route Street, which is just right at the end of that bulb. Um, I'm concerned mostly with the traffic pattern. Um, if the street goes through with um, respects to Prospect Valley Elementary School, I'm actually a retired financial uh, principal secretary from Prospect Valley. Prospect Valley has approximately 500 students, uh, give or take a, a few here and there. 80% um, of Prospect Valley students are choice enrolled which means all of those students are brought in by their parents because they do not live in the actual footprint of the neighborhood of the school. So we're having 400 children being dropped off and then picked up and brought in for parents field day, brought in for kindergarten nights, brought in for parent teacher conferences. So we have approximately, even if you put two students per vehicle, um, approximately 250 or 200 cars, um, two, three, and sometimes even more than that um, each day. So most of that traffic um, obviously now comes out of off of Quail and Parfait. But then we would bring most of that traffic or some of that traffic through uh, Route Street, which right now the character of Route Street is a nice quiet cul-de-sac small subdivision. Whereas if you add all of these um, cars and, and traffic to that, it no longer um, keeps that subdivision um, a safe traffic pattern for the people who live on Route Street. And that's what I have to say tonight. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Mark Williams. And then Lori Strand. My name is Mark Hillam, H-I-L-L-A-M. I live at 3310 Route Street. Uh, most of the things I would like to say have been mentioned. Um, with the housing density difference uh, was mentioned as well. Uh, the number of cars that are going through there on a daily basis. Uh, there are other options to get emergency access uh, based on the turnaround and the small size that's uh, been evaluated for the access to Rob Street. Uh, you could easily put a single lane um, emergency access lane if you wanted to that went through that was only emergency access and there are plenty of types of barriers that could be put up that do not allow uh, traffic to flow through but a fire truck or whatever could easily just drive over those and they would pop back up or whatever. There's plenty of engineered solutions that would uh, suffice to do that to prevent this from be, being required to be a through street. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. And now I would like um, Laurie Strand followed by Kate Dean. Hello, my name is Laurie Strand and I live at 3445 Quail Court. I live at the end of the cul-de-sac in the Quail Hollow subdivision, and you received my, my letter tonight, hot off the press. I think it was the last to be received, so it's at the top of your pile. Um, 
I agree with a lot of what um, was said tonight. Uh, I too am primarily concerned with through traffic on 33rd Avenue. Uh, I just moved to the neighborhood from Northwest Denver in September. I have a three and a half year old who is a madman on his tricycle um, <laughs> and, and a two -year, who has a two year old brother who would very much like to be a madman on his tricycle once he can reach his pedals. Um, so I'm, I'm primarily concerned with the through traffic um, from the school in the morning and the afternoon hours. I will say I'm, I'm generally supportive and in fact excited about the development of, of the lot next to us, the property next to us. Um, myself and, and my neighbor, uh, Kate, who's gonna speak in a minute, we've actually talked about maybe there'll be more families there, maybe there'll be more kids to play with, there'll be another sidewalk for our kids to ride on without having to go on to 32nd Avenue, which is, which is really exciting. Um, but I think there's other alternatives here, and I, and I request tonight that you deny the plat that's before you um, to provide an opportunity for the developer to go back to the table and, and perhaps to discuss the emergency access option um, more fully with the fire district. Um, I know that somebody spoke earlier tonight about some other communities that have done gates and it, and it has satisfied the fire district, Fireside being one of them. Um, so I don't think that, that we should kind of push that aside. I think there's an opportunity for them to go back, um, talk with the fire district, talk more with staff, and kind of appease the concerns with the neighbors. I don't, I don't see that there's any benefit to the existing neighborhoods. Um, really, um, the only support I've heard tonight is, is, is from the developer and, and staff. So um, I request you to deny, deny tonight and, and send them back to the table. And, and I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about the potential development. I truly am. And um, hope there's some more families and, and that's safe for all of us. So, thank, thank you, Laurie. I actually, I'm sorry. I was, have one more set of comments from my neighbors who could not be here tonight. So oh, my neighbors, uh, Leo and Jane Sands, live immediately adjacent to me, and I'm just gonna read a, a couple of bullets from their comments, which you also received. Um, I'm writing to document our objections to certain aspects of the above reference project, i.e. the Merkwood Homes development. Current plans call for connection of 33rd Avenue to Rob Street, creating very real safety concerns for the residents of Quail Hollow especially for the many young children playing near their homes in Quail Hollow and on Quail Court. I know that um, Jane and Leo have young girl ch grandchildren that are the same age as my children, so they are concerned. Um, the Merkwood project needs to ensure that Rob Street opens to 32nd Avenue to obviate the need to use Quail Hollow's Quail Court as a through street. Rob Street should be closed to Quail Court, 33rd Avenue, to lessen the child safety concerns for Quail Hollow, as well as to eliminate additional hazardous traffic from Prospect Valley Elementary School. A traffic light on 32nd and Quail would make it safer to exit Quail and Rob onto 32nd Avenue, going both east and west, and would help greatly to make pre and post school day traffic a safer proposition. And they thank you for, for your consideration. Thanks. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. And Kate Dean, followed by Nicholas Marcello. Hi, I'm Kate Dean. I am at 3350 Quail Court, so right where 33rd Avenue meets. Quail Court, so one of the most affected homes in Quail Hollow. And I have a two and a half year old and one on the way. And we are in fully agreement with what Lori said. So I'll keep it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nicholas, followed by Mr. DeTulio. Hi, I'm uh, Nick Marcello. I live at 3241 Route Street. And uh, I just wanted to say, as a youth growing up in the cul-de-sac, I really appreciated it, especially because, you know, kids are kids. And when I was a kid, I'd always kick the ball out of the driveway or something. It'd roll into the street, and I really appreciated that it uh, had the cul-de-sac because it made me feel a little bit safer. And, you know, that's about it. And then. Uh, I was just curious how many people in the room are against connecting Quail to Route Street with 33rd? Uh, sorry about that. How many people are against connecting Quail to Route Street with 33rd? All right, so I just wanted to see if, how many there were, and it looks like there's 31 people in this room against it. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeTulio. Mr. DeTulio has declined. We are done with public testimony, and now we can 
might be some, we get back here where we were. <clears throat> Any more applicant response? That would be a time that I would ask for that. Would you like to say something, sir? Uh, thanks for all the input from you guys. Uh, if if city council is inclined to vote against this as is, uh, I, I would I would ask for a continuance if that is possible or some. I, I don't know what the mechanism is, but I, I have presented some options that take all of these things into consideration, and uh, I, I don't know what happens if it's denied. I don't want to start from scratch and I think there are a couple of good options that I've presented uh, specifically 33rd just taking a left down Rob Street and then the pedestrian connection at the end of Rob Street everything would stay the same it would just not go all the way through I've, I, I sent that as a an alternative I've also proposed the fire access restriction as an alternative and there the, the reason I didn't raise my hand when you asked to vote is obvious. I'm in a very difficult situation here. But there, there are some very uh, good alternatives uh, that, that we could sort through. Um, it, it sounds like there's an overwhelming response from both communities. I, 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 I can't in good conscience sit and build my own home in a community where everybody is opposed to what I'm doing. So that if you guys are going to deny it, uh, we've satisfied all the city's recommendations and regulations. The challenge is if you deny it, that means that the approval of a variance would have to be put before a vote. Otherwise, I can't do something with this property. And it's a very unfair situation for me, is I've done everything that the city has recommended. Everything, I've followed every rule. I always follow the rules. and to then follow those rules only to be told that you can't follow those rules by your neighbors saying that, hey, you know what, I don't like what you're building so you can't do it, is a very difficult situation because now I would, I'm, I'm sort of throwing myself at, at the, the feet of city council saying, hey, I'm completely open to all of, to taking into consideration everything that the neighbors have put forth. And I think I have two great options. I have the fire restriction option. Question. I also have the left-hand turn option. And the left-hand turn option is by far the biggest, uh, the, what people would be in most favor of because we would just give back the easement if, if that's even in our power to do. Uh, we just turn left. It just adds seven more houses to the Quail Hollow development. It goes from a, sort of a 700 foot or 1,000 feet to 1,400 foot dead end, but Sims is another perfect example of that dead end, and it's right next door. So the precedence is already there, as a couple of people have brought up. Uh, so I, I don't mean to take too much time, but if, if that's going to be the situation, uh, pl please understand that I would have to literally just reapply for a variance, and, and I then have to go through this entire process again. I've been going through this for a year and a half now and I've done what the city has asked. Now I'm trying to do what the neighbors are asking. I think there's an alternative that takes into the city's recommendation and the neighbor's recommendation. And I, and I would just ask that you vote in favor of that if I amend the proposal and give it to you guys in two weeks time. Okay, point of order, Madam Mayor. Do I understand that we do not have the option of continuing this? That we, we must either uh, approve or deny? Mr. Dalton. Yeah, okay. I, I can run you through the through the options you have. You know, it's a subdivision approval or a subdivision application. So you have two options in the packet already. Approve it with the staff conditions as described, deny, and direct me to prepare uh, findings. Uh, a third thing you could do, and it's already been discussed, is uh, set it over for a variance hearing. To do that, I would recommend that, that you uh, close this hearing but not act. In other words, close the hearing, continue it for action to uh, have to be two weeks at least, probably four out, so that you can publish the appropriate notice for a variance hearing because it was not noticed tonight for a variance hearing and, and that would have to take place. And it is you that can conduct that hearing because that variance 
under the code would be a part of the subdivision application. But if you'd already acted on the subdivision application, it's no longer a part of it, variance would go to BOA and you would want to hear it here. So door number three would be close this hearing, set a variance hearing for uh, whenever you can, two weeks, a month out, and continue for action on the subdivision until the same night as that variance hearing, and then you'd vote on both. Door number four would be, as requested by the applicant, uh, continue this subdivision entirely, continue the hearing. So the hearing remains open, applicant comes up with uh, three great solutions that he memorializes in a revised plat. Uh, the hearing's already open it's effectively, and so you don't need to re-notice. Uh, that's information's made generally available to the neighborhood and staff can look at it and render some thoughts. It goes in your packet for two weeks from now or whenever you can get it together. And then you look at it and you could, at that time, you can, you're back to approve or deny. So those are the four doors. Sorry, there's four. I'd like so, to be through. So we can continue. Yes, you can. But if you choose to continue so that you can have a subdivision redesign as opposed to just look at this variance question on the, the length of the cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. then you're continuing the whole hearing. And I think that would be fair because, of course, if, if there's some other design issues, the neighborhood's going to want to be able at that continued hearing to speak on it. Right. If it's just the variance, the neighborhood's spoken on the subdivision, you can, you can sort of close that record. But the neighborhood's not heard about the, the variance necessarily. It's been discussed, but there's been no application. So, so when you get to that point, I can help you with a motion. Does that work for you then? That's that, yeah, that, that works. Or number I'm four. Oh, is that four? Meredith, did you want it? Well, what, what I would recommend is that don't do two weeks, do a month, because we have the 15-day noticing for the variance piece of it. Okay. And I don't think we could legally make two weeks. Fair enough. So, all right. So that would be the only thing different. I think if they're going to continue just the subdivision hearing itself, Meredith, they could continue that to two weeks out because sure. the hearing's already open. It's only if you go with door three, this let's entertain a, a cul-de-sac length variance mm -hmm. just because of the way the code's written. We're going to need a month for that. But we'd have to do that, though, in any case, right? We're going to have to do that. Not necessarily. It depends upon what he comes back with as a, as a proposal. Uh, it's, it might be safe to continue it for a month so that if what he ends up deciding to come back with includes the subdivision or the uh, cul-de-sac variance, then you're able to publish it. Yeah, probably so. That's safer, one month. Mr. Matthews, did you want to ask a question? Yes, I did. Um, if I could ask a couple of quick questions for you, so I'd, and I'd like just to get this on the table before we do one thing or the other also, but while you're there. This lot seven that's at the north end of 33rd extended, what, that it, well, it's gone now, but it looks like it's about 300 feet or something to the floodplain. What what is is there any plan for lot seven? The piece going north. Uh, it looks like you have about four or five hundred feet of ownership north of 33rd, but the you, seventh lot I was thought I was told there's nothing going to happen up there. This, this lot right here? Yes. Uh, I've, I've kept it so I could build a dream home. <clears throat> you can see the floodplain designation on that northern third. Um, some of it he could do something with the red stripey area. It would allow no construction whatsoever. It's called floodway. So. Okay, but it looks like from the actual center line of 33rd Avenue up to the beginning of the floodplain, there's got to be at least 300 feet there. So, so at least the, ver it's still in plan. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, frankly. I, okay. I don't even, I'm just, I'm, I'm looking for some alternatives. Okay. And I was just, and, and so, and if well, that's your dream home, that's fine. I have no objection. I, I just, I, I would like to, the way I have envisioned it is, well, well I, I'm sorry, you can keep that to your, yourself. Okay. I was told there was nothing going to be built there, but if there's a plan for building there, I was just noting there seems to be some space there. And so 
There's not enough space for a turnaround or a cul-de-sac. No, but there would be for a, a home. And if you're already planning on that, that that's, that's fine. That's the difference. Because I was going to suggest maybe a the whole lot number one home could be built there, and that would give more room for work coming off of 32nd. Um, this, this 32nd, <laughs> that's the route street people of art can already attest to. You wind up with that grade differential that makes it just about impossible to reconcile throughout. Right now, it's a relatively flat, but you make up for that flatness with a giant retaining wall right here along 32nd. So we would just continue that retaining wall the whole way, provide the fire to turn around here. I would literally just take in an amended application, 33rd, turn left. You drive down here to the same hammerhead that we've already proposed, give this back to the Route Street side. Maybe we could have big block parties here <laughs> and, and, and just leave it at that. We become seven more, uh, neighbors i also i have a i have a four-year-old girl myself so the idea of her running through that's why i moved out of the highlands into wheat ridge is for the very things that wheat ridge offers as amenities i'm still young with a lot of fight left so i want to see some of these projects go through i love wheat ridge i want to see i'll be here for a long time building a lot of stuff and i i love infill stuff so this is these are the types of complexities and challenges i like to solve and i i try to and and there's a contextual issue here that's been brought up and, and the context has been brought up by me as an argument in the beginning is grid patterns don't necessarily make sense in this application. Uh, I, I agree with that, but I also agree there is an argument to be made by city that connectivity 50 years from now, you may be sort of sorry that you didn't get the grid pattern when you had it. Uh, th those may be problems for another time. I am getting ready to close this and if there's no more questions of I move that we continue this meeting. Well, we can close this, but not act upon Well, you can't close it. I think it. what you need to figure point, out point is of order. whether you're closing it or, I mean, depending upon the door you're taking, you may not close the hearing. You may just continue the hearing. Uh, we'll continue. We'll so continue I think we should see some motions, hearing. and then you'll know. I mean, if, if the, if you close the hearing, you've closed the hearing and, and really continuing. You can only continue it then for action. Okay. Is my point. If there's going to be more, then I think Council Member Matthews it, it, wants to speak to that. And if you'd let the council discuss their options right now. Right. So I have a couple questions for staff. Okay. We have another question for staff. I, I think I think Council Member Matthews is first. Well, just okay. I, I could. I'll yield for the question to staff, but I would like to come back with a point of order afterwards. All right. So you're yielding, you're yielding the floor, and you would like to ask staff a question. Sure. Um, as it relates to the presentation prior to the public uh, comment that was provided by the residents, uh, I had two questions. One is related to um, why wasn't uh, the uh, Prospect Valley uh, School um, discussion brought up within that presentation and that um, that traffic influence in this um, neighborhood uh, brought up in that presentation in my mind that that would seem to be a, a very uh, strong influence in this uh, in this uh, thoroughfare because it would it would seem to me to be the, the strongest influence in the traffic pattern of this through street and the reason why this through street would be going through uh, but in my notes here, and, and I'd have to go back and look at the tape, but uh, it doesn't appear as though we uh, went through any sort of major discussion about Prospect Valley uh, at all in that presentation. So uh, my, my concern is we just, that was sort of either glossed over or not even discussed. No, we, we did not include anything in the presentation about Prospect Valley. Um, again, the, the, the school traffic is something that happens in the morning, the afternoon for a fairly brief period of time, the vast majority of the time. Um, this becomes just a through street connecting some neighborhoods, and as one resident brought out, there's not going to be a lot of people from 32nd going up to this route, but certainly there is a chance, I, I don't deny that at all, that, that some, fa some parents that are wanting to go west from here might use this as a way to avoid the Quail Street intersection to come out onto, onto 32nd. That's possible. And from a staff point standpoint, I understand where they're coming from, but from a staff point standpoint, we don't think that's a bad thing. We think the more, the more we can distribute traffic from these, these high intense 
um, if you will, very brief generators, the better off it is for everybody. You know, that, yes, there will be more traffic on route, but there'll be less traffic on quail. So we think that's a benefit for quail. Maybe it's a downside for route during that brief period of time when the school's opening up and, and shutting down. Um, so, but that's, there wasn't anything in the presentation. When I think there is a presentation, we didn't modify it much for this particular meeting. But if we have a high intensity uh, traffic driver within a block of this subdivision, why would that not be in that presentation? Because, but for the resident's presentation, because of the way that these quasi-judicial hearings are set up, Council would not be presented with that information. And as it relates to schools, it only takes one car going too fast for that to be a tragic accident. So that's my concern is sure. that, that it doesn't take but one you know, car going too fast for that to be the issue. And I guess my comment to that is we have kids on every street in our town. We have a lot of connected streets. We have a lot of connected streets around a lot of our schools. And so this isn't a, a one-off situation where we're suddenly making a situation in Route Street that doesn't exist everywhere else in Wheat Ridge around our schools. So from a traffic standpoint, we see this as a good thing as a way to help distribute traffic. Um, during, the, during the Planning Commission, we actually talked about people from Route Street. When church is in session, there's a lot of traffic back and forth across 32nd. They might use this as a way to get to Quail if they want to go east. Um, so from, again, from, from our standpoint as staff, we see connecting things as a good thing. It gives people options, it gives people other ways to go. If there's something happening in one location, they can get out the other location. If we have an accident at Quail Street, then every woman in the school might decide to come out this way to, to get out on the 32nd. But it gives them the option to do that instead of just being stuck at the school while waiting for the accident to clear. Mm -hmm. So again, that's our reason for the connectivity. It's not, we're not trying to harm property values. We're not trying to do anything like that. We're trying to provide people options in all of these neighborhoods to have different ways to get in and out. So, and then my next question is it relates to the statement that it's been clearly been the city's intent to provide this street connection, but as it relates to the, the citizens' comments and their statements, that seems to be a direct con uh, contradiction to that, those statements and the, the statements that have been provided by the residents. So m my question to staff is what evidence do we have that this has been the intent of the city or the vision of the city to make that connection, to, to well, make in, that through? In 1983, there was an exhibit in the staff report that showed that connection for 33rd going over to Quail Street. And the, the citizen's and, comment was that that was a utility right away, not a not Well, a it, it may have originally started that way, but when the staff report was prepared, when, when, as Meredith pointed out, the exhibit that's in your packet today shows that connection being made. When we as staff, I started here in 2007, so I was not involved in the original sort of quail hollow that was done in 2007. When the quail hollow that currently exists was processed, we saw the right of way connecting east from route, and we said this is a great place to make a connection and provide a connection and not have a lot of cul-de-sacs. I understand the, the desire of a lot of people to live on cul-de-sacs, but from a traffic standpoint, cul-de-sacs are a bad thing. I live on a very connected neighborhood, and I love it, and we've got kids all up and down the street, and to my knowledge, we've never had anybody killed there. So um, it's a 1,400-foot-long street with you know 20 houses on, on both sides kind of thing, and, and people drive relatively slow. I've got a speed bump in front of my house. We've offered up... If this neighborhood's really worried about speeding traffic, this is a perfect candidate, either um, 30th Ward or Route Street, to do speed humps or some kind of traffic mitigation. That we can certainly do that. That's that's certainly an option. So I would just say that uh, it's sort of ironic that we are talking about cul-de-sacs because an alternate definition of cul-de-sacs is a route or a course leading to nowhere. Because connecting uh, this. Uh, street through to route street seems to me to be a, a route to nowhere in the sense that it doesn't serve that uh, route street doesn't serve the uh, quail hollow it doesn't serve this neighborhood to connect these streets so that that to me I don't think just based on the evidence that was provided by the citizens uh, it doesn't show that there is that intent and I would encourage staff to move away from making that connection and focus more on the alternative solutions that don't involve making that through connection because that 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 to me seems to be a more viable solution because uh, just based on the the testimony provided by the residents and the history provided by uh, the builders in this area are, are such that uh, the, the the and the previous landowners that uh, there was never an intent by these landowners to have a through street in this area, period. And the, the, the suggestion that cul-de-sacs are bad uh, with over 23 cul-de-sacs in the area, uh, I don't see that, that being the case because that's the character of that area. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> One more thing. The Planning Commission, 
I thought, maybe I'm crazy. I found that exhibit. I had looked through the file from 1983. I got it back out today, and I looked at it again. And it, in the staff write-up, it kept calling the cul-de-sac bulb temporary. So clearly, there was maybe not an intent from the developer. And I do remember Jean Archer. So, um, But clearly, staff was driving those, those internal connections. So I'm not crazy, I don't think. No one's saying no. Hmm. Mr. Matthews. <laughs> okay, um, I guess I'm going to make a couple comments first. <laughs> Just in that, A, I think we've already tonight, we've come up with some several, some different options that are available to keep the majority of the neighborhood um, satisfied. I mean, a, a, a I'm not worried about connect, the connectivity. I mean, to me, it's a little bit like we have a, a rule or used to in the state that if you build something here, you can't move your stormwater off on your neighbor. Well, to open a street so a stormwater full of cars can come onto the neighbor's neighborhood, I'm not sure that's necessarily the way I'd like to see things happen either. Um, and I'm not particularly concerned about our 750 foot rule because so far as what I can tell right now, it's just an arbitrary number. There's, we've been able to come up with no engineering standard that says anything over 750 foot is bad and anything under that is good. And I don't think cul-de-sacs are bad. So I would, I'm reaching for a way here to keep the allow the neighborhoods that exist to keep their character and allow the developer to develop this piece of property in as sane a manner as necessary. And I think we have to come up with, whether it be a bicycle or a pedestrian access at the end or whatever, but I see no reason why we have to make, why it's just imperative that 33rd has to run through to anywhere. So. My original point of order was I would like to make sure that however we state that, that it gives the maximum flexibility to the developer to work out some of these different scenarios that have been discussed tonight that I'm aware of. And I, I'm assuming two weeks or four weeks you would prefer to keep your options as open as possible. And that was just my question for point of order as I got a confu little confused there on the four options, but I would caution us and really encourage us to do the maximum number of whatever it takes to give the maximum number of options to find a variance here and not be stuck with some arbitrary numbers. Door number four does that because door number four was to continue this hearing, do not close it for testimony continue this hearing to uh, four weeks from now. Uh, within that time, the applicant can choose to just redesign, and it's a redesigned subdivision, don't need a variance. Redesign plus a variance, or don't redesign, do a variance, but it gives him all of those, those choices. You can work with staff. If it looks like you want to trigger a variance hearing for that same night, a month out, you've got plenty of time to get the notices out for that. That would be July 24th. I would then ask Mr. Mr. Fitzgerald to to make that motion that we continue this hearing, hearing with that option of variances that were needed, that flexibility. Okay. Uh, I move we continue this hearing until four weeks from now. July 24th at 7 o'clock p.m. Right. With the provision that if uh, necessary, we may also con uh, conduct a um, Yeah, hearing on a variance for the length of the cul-de-sac. That's fine. I mean, the applicant may, without you saying so, the applicant has the right to apply for a variance on the cul-de-sac. And if they choose to make that application sometime in the next four weeks, staff will go ahead and publish and post. And it's good the applicant knows that. Uh, but it, it doesn't have to be a part of the motion to allow them that option. Right. That Second. works for you. Seconded by Mr. Matthews. That works for you, right? Uh, is there s yeah uh yeah it, I, I would love the opportunity to with with all of the feedback from the neighborhood and the feedback to extend 
you know, to give us a chance to try this yeah, and looks see like if everybody it can meet these regulations with minimal variance as possible. Uh, the, the variance I think that would come up is, you know, the, the length of the, the cul-de-sac oh, length. Right. So if, if this motion is what does that, I, I'm not, I'm sort of ignorant when it comes to this stuff, so I apologize if, but yeah, that's a, I, I think that would be great. That way I could talk to the, the, the neighbors one more time. Sure. I could talk to the staff and we could sort of put our heads together in a way that can solve both of these challenges. Sounds like everybody wants to make Everybody's it work. Happy. Right, okay. we're, all, cool. we're all going the same way. Right. Um, we have a first, uh, we have a second on it, so I, I don't know if we have more discussion or we can just go to the vote. You're voting on continuing this hearing. To um, July the 24th at seven o'clock p.m. July 24th, that's so that uh, well, that's a variety the of, of, oper of systems can be brought forward, okay? Yeah. I believe did so, you so alternatives will be brought to us by the developer and you're going to communicate and reach out to the, to the citizens in the neighborhood. I'll reach out to the neighborhood and okay. the staff okay. uh, with our alternatives. Okay, great. Thank you. The variance will be posted, right? Well, if, if they apply for it. If you know, we keep trying to fashion we'll what will happen in the next four weeks. What you really need to do is give them the four weeks and let them fashion it. I do, do I need to file additional paperwork um well but perhaps but it's not the council's debating a motion right now and and that you'll need well, to take on. up with uh, this right. um, as it relates to alternatives one of the alternatives that we want to uh, clarify is that an alternative that, that at least i'm not interested in seeing is a connection to route street from 33rd that uh that as you're looking at uh, uh, connections and, and options and alternatives is that the Route Street cul-de-sac remain a cul-de-sac and that it be not connected uh, to uh, this development. I, I think that's why we're, we're doing this. Well, I just, I, I want to make sure that that's crystal right, clear. Just make it clear. That's why we're turning the, basically continuing this. So as I'm, as I'm sort of playing this forward in my mind, with the drainage that's on the east side of this lot, um, the design today has that drainage overflowing 33rd to continue north. And the reason that was okay was because we had the connection to the west. Mm. So from a, from a, if, as we, as we, if we don't make this through street connection, the way the lots are laid out today with that drainage on the east side of the lot, actually the best location to probably connect is to the west of Route Street, not to Quail Hollow. Does that does that make sense what I'm what I'm saying? Yes, it does. So you think it might be wise to so, keep that I, option I don't, know, open. I don't know where we'll land. We can talk to the engineer. We can set up scenarios. We can meet and we can talk about these things. But but I think precluding saying that this this subdivision has to connect to 33rd Avenue to the east maybe sets up a situation that from a drainage standpoint might be more difficult to deal with than than the connection to Route Street. And, I, and at the Planning Commission meeting, the, the Route Street neighborhood all said they were okay with the subdivision, they were okay with the subdivision actually connecting the route. I'm not going to speak for them, but that was what I remember. Um, but they didn't want the through street connection. I think the issue is the through street connection. I don't think they're opposed to Mark, I, look, I, I, think, I think the point that Mark's making is that we can't make those decisions tonight. Right. I mean, give us the time to sit down with the developer and staff, and, and we'll take all the neighborhood's con concerns into, into place. Basically, we, we can't we, put any rules We understand on. there's a lot of concerns about connecting to route, so we'll take that into consideration. Um, and and hopefully we can find a solution where that, that doesn't have to happen. So um, obviously, obviously if it comes back as routes the only option, you guys can have a decision to vote it down or up at that point. Right. Is, is, is that, that is clear? That okay? What he's saying is that it but, might but be it, Route Street it's connection. It's very clear. I, Mr. Could Rupert, be Quail it's very Street. clear that the route is not a preferred option. So It's not the preferred option, but we have to leave that door open in case planning-wise, we you know, engineering-wise, it can't be done. Yeah, that was just my intent, was that they have the maximum number of options. Yes. And if you ask to file for three different variances, do so. <laughs> we can sort through the pick of the litter, <laughs> but give everybody the maximum amount of compromise and win-win as possible. Are we ready to vote? Please cast your votes. Vote carries uh, six to zero. Vote carries. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for being very patient, quiet, understanding, and very nice crowd to work with. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here.
and we all we all want the best to happen for y'all. Okay, let's move on. Item three. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to dig this out here. Do you all need a break or? Okay. I'm okay. I'm good. We won't hit this will go fast now. Hopefully. Okay. Yeah. Right. Judging by the unless you're a problem. Take a break because this noise is going to go on for a while. <laughs> Thanks, Meredith.
Is the clerk ready? Turn to the meeting. Item number three. We're going to item number three. Mrs. Hoppy. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Item number three is Council Bill number 12 2017, an ordinance reappointing presiding municipal judge Christopher Randall, increasing his hourly compensation and approving a presiding municipal judge services agreement. At issue, the city's home rule charter provides for appointment of the municipal court judge for a team of two year, term of two years. The current term of presiding judge Christopher Randall expires July 1st, 2017. The judge is presently compensated at $96.09 per hour. This rate has been in effect since 2015. The judge has requested an increase to 98.97 per hour. This change is reflected in the attached agreement. I do, this is a new ordinance. I need a number. First reading, so uh, we don't need a number yet. Just a Oh, motion. you're right. These are Sorry. all first reading. We're good. First reading. Then that's all we need to do then. I need a motion and a second. I move to approve Council Bill number 12-2017 an ordinance reappointing presiding municipal judge Christopher Randall, increasing his hourly compensation and approving a presiding municipal judge services agreement. On first reading, order it published, public hearing set for Monday, July 10th, 2017 at 7 p.m. in city council chambers and that it take effect upon adoption at second reading. Second. Seconded by Ms. Duran. Please cast your votes. Motion carries five to one with one vote no. Ab abstain, I'm sorry, with Fitzgerald abstaining. I would like to explain I'm ex ex abstaining because I was not at the study session. Um, well, I would, I would tell you that, that um, uh, an abstention really only available where it was, say, a quasi-judicial matter and you hadn't been at the hearing is one or where you would have a conflict of interest, a financial conflict of interest. Uh, here, it's my advice that, 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 uh, that you should vote. The materials in the packet are sufficient to permit you to have an opinion, and I would urge that you exercise your vote. I guess we're going to re-vote. Re-vote. Motion carries six to zero. Item four, which is also first reading, Mr. Urban. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Let's see. One second while I pull it up. Council Bill number 13-2017, an ordinance approving a lease with Verizon Wireless for the placement of cellular and tenant facility on the Wheat Ridge Recreation Center. Uh, the, at issue, the council is asking for approval of a lease with Verizon Wireless for placement of a cellular antenna facility on the Wheat Ridge Recreation Center. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Department has been negotiating with Verizon for several months. The term is five years with three options to extend for five years each. The annual rental payment is $25,000 for the first year with increasing by 2% each following year. The antenna facility will be fully contained on the roof of the building as shown in the attached photo simulations. There will be an accessory concrete equipment pad at the rear west side of the building. The location diagram and photo simulation are attached. Thank you. Please give us a motion. I move to approve Council Bill number 13-2017, an ordinance approving a lease with Verizon Wireless for the placement of a cellular antenna facility on the Wheat Ridge Recreation Center. For first reading, order published, public hearing set for Monday, July 10th, 2017 at 7 p.m. in the City Council Chambers and that it take effect upon adoption. Second. 
Welch, seconded by Ms. Duran. Please cast your votes. Motion carries six to zero. Thank you. Item five, Mr. Matthews. Item five is council bill number 14-2017, an ordinance amending sections 16-81 and 16-84 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws to legalize gravity knives and switchblades consistent with state law. At issue is uh, as follows, through the adoption of Senate Bill 17-008 during the last legislative session, the Colorado Legislature amended state statutes to remove gravity knives and switchblades from the list of weapons that it is unlawful to possess under state law. This amendment goes into effect on August 9th of 2017. The Wheat Ridge Police Department recommends amending section 16-81 and 16-84 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws to legalize gravity knives and switchblades in order to be consistent with state law. Thank you. This is first reading once again. Please give us a motion. I move to approve Council Bill 14-2017 and ordinance to amend sections 16-81 and 16-84 of the Wheat Ridge Code of Laws to legalize gravity knives and switchblades consistent with state law on first reading, order it published, public hearing set for Monday, July 10th at 7 p.m. in the City Council Chambers and that it take effect 15 days after final publication. Second. Madam Mayor, I'd like to just provide the definitions of those two for the general public, if that's okay. Why don't you wait to second reading? Oh, if that's all right, I'll do that at the second reading. It, it just seems more appropriate so that we Thank you. move on tonight. Yes, um, second. Okay. That concludes our business meeting. Sorry? Yeah, vote on it. Vote on the motion. Oh, go ahead. Please vote. Cast your votes. Motion carries. Six zero. Now, that concludes our business meeting. Let's move on to city manager's meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we'd like to give you a, a, a quick update on our um, roofing permit process um, that has um, from the from the May eighth uh, hailstorm. And, and Ken and, and, and our city treasurer would also like to provide a little bit of an update um, while we're at it. Um, Mr. DiTulio did pass out our, our um, bi-weekly bi report that shows the number of permits that we've been processing and the revenues that um, are being generated. And <clears throat> we're gonna start tracking the additional costs. We don't have it quite yet on this form, but we'll we'll have those on, um, on, on the next report. But um, roofing permit applications are s still continuing to be um, submitted in very significant numbers. Uh, um, <clears throat> although that we're, we're processing um, these permits um, in record and issuing permits in record numbers, as you can see from the handout, um, we still need to do a better job of ensuring that we can issue permits in a timely fashion. Um, we're continuing to staff up both um, with our with building permit technicians and building inspectors. Um, we have a contract firm, Charles Abbott. They continue to provide additional um, resources as they can. Um, they have a limit also on how many how many staff they could provide. Um, I've personally reached out um, over the last couple of weeks to the cities of Westminster, Golden, Lakewood, and Arvada to see if they had staff that they could provide, but um, unfortunately, um, they're just as busy as we are from the hailstorm and just, just the general economy. Um, there's a lot of, of construction going on in the metro area. Um, we've also reached out to the Department of Local Affairs who um, help in, in these situations and the Colorado chapter of the International Code Council um, requesting additional resources. Um, again, um, they are going to reach out to their membership to see if they can provide additional um, resources, but their initial response at this, this point was that um, um, building officials along the front range all the way down to Pueblo um, are experiencing high demand um, in this area too, so um, they're also short on staff. But So we're reaching out to many different um, um, partners and agencies to see if we can continue um, uh, beefing up our staffing, and Ken can give a little bit more update on that. Um, and well, yeah, I'll just turn it over to, to Jerry. Do you want to go first? So I'd like to refer council to the roofing permits and inspections, the June 26th bi-weekly report. I'd ask staff to generate this 
every two weeks for us. And uh, first of all, I want to refer to the back where it has uh, roofing permits and inspections, online applications submitted. So as you can see, since June 7th, uh, we've received 1,464 applications online. That number isn't correlated to anything else on the front page because some, are, some have been processed and some haven't been. So this 1,464 is the total number of applications submitted online for roofs. So if anybody has any questions on that before I flip it over. Nope. So then uh, to go back to the front page, um, RRF stands for residential roof. And um, if you look at the column where it says permits processed, if you go on down to 2017 year to date, that 2017 isn't a typo. Actually, for, since uh, beginning of January, the city has processed 2017 permits, all permits. That's roofs, everything else that's definitely been submitted to the city. Of that, the RRF permits processed or residential roof, 1,465 so far. And then if you go across all the way to the very right where it says RR. F permit total so far the city has collected this is uh, unanticipated revenue for the, the city of six hundred and twenty thousand six hundred fifty seven dollars and twenty six cents and um, I had mentioned before that we were going to track the uh, labor costs well if you go on down to the contract labor costs estimated costs as you can see we didn't have any contract permit technicians until June 5th and, and Mr. Johnson will discuss this further and they bill every 30 days. So we haven't even possibly received a bill yet because it's every 30 days that we're gonna be getting a bill from the, the company, the contract company. So based on the $620,000, $620,000 that's been raised, plus Patrick had um, his fr is freezing some projects, that will allow me to pay the Fruitdale $310,000 bill to sign off on that and that'll be able to maintain our um, reserve at 17%. And Patrick, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, as Mr. Tsulio, um noted, we, um, we we looked at this year's budget, had staff um, look at this year's budget just um, with, with the closure of um, our Walmart um, July 7th. Um, I thought it was prudent to, to look at some expenditures that we could potentially freeze for this year. Um, and uh, we, we've identified just, just under um, half a million um, um, miscellaneous items. A lot of it's um, staffing salary savings. Honestly, I think there's a couple, about 129,000 are, are staffing salary savings. So it, most of the things we're looking at freezing are not going to have an impact on our citizens, but they're just some some budget numbers that we can put on hold. So with that, plus the additional revenues that we're seeing from these building permits and use tax, um, we're able to pay um, the June invoice for the Fruitdale project, and, and we'll have a estimated reserve of 17.7 percent so we should have after this payment we have i think just about another half million five hundred thousand to pay on that project so um, we should hopefully with additional revenues still coming in we should be able to make hopefully the july and or the five hundred thousand payments in the next couple months so so the additional um, permitting fees will offset the, the losses that we have from from Using, losing Walmart. <coughs> um, eventually, yes. Um, eventually. Also, that um, it's it's but it's enabling us to um, pay our contract services, but it's also allowing us to keep to keep our reserve up to a certain level and pay the fruit deals. So we're looking at this um, on a every, every two weeks and almost a monthly basis to make sure that we're maintaining that 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 um, threshold. Um, there's going to be other adjustments when. Um, we, we start losing revenue from Walmart. We're, we haven't right. yet. Um, we'll still get um, payments through um, 1st of August through Walmart. So, um, we, yep. we don't have any figures yet on what the contract labor is right. going to be. Correct. Okay, so that has to be taken into consideration. Yes. Well. And so the, the, one of the points that was made, I think, by Councilmember Urban and a few and staff members is that right now we've, for residential roof permits, we've done for 2017, 1,465. But we know there's between 12 and 14,000 rooftops in the city, so this could potentially reflect a 10% of the city being done so far, and that would be that would mean that um, if you extrapolate that out, that that could potentially be revenue of six million dollars in revenue and permits, and that brings up a point that Mr. Matthews asked about. He wanted to know why, in 2017, we actually had more 
permits process so far than 2016, but why was the all permits total revenue less? All the permits are calculated based on the size of the project and uh, the cost, the value. So right now they're le it's less because they're residential roof permits and it's a smaller dollar amount per permit. But at the end of the day, if, if we if 1465 is 10% of the total revenue and roofs done in the city, that could be you know toward upwards of six million dollars potentially. But we don't know that. So I'm just I'm just looking ahead at and uh, using empirical evidence. And then Mr. Jossel wanted to discuss maybe the labor costs and the report in that area too. So that's why we're watching it. Mr. Matthews, you had a question? Yeah, I, we'd, we've talked here about contract, but I was just gonna ask if uh, we're tracking overtime costs and our, our inspectors and all this, are they exempt or are they hourly? Or if we're incurring overtime and or comp time or what have you, are we tracking those and making sure they get addressed as an ex, as an offset offset to the revenue. We, yes, definitely. Yeah, we're tracking those as well. Um, we, you know, we we'll be in front of council with the budget supplemental request um, sometime soon. We're just trying to get kind of a stabilized model here so that we're feeling better about what those numbers are going to be towards you know to to make it kind of through year end or as close as possible to to make that estimate. Uh, and we've been working on our 2018 budget as well with Patrick and Heather. Uh, so those processes are working uh, together. Uh, in, you know, in terms of the total number of permits, it's so hard to tell. I mean, Mr. Tulio is certainly right. We have some people saying, you know, nearly every roof was affected, but, you know, we'll have to see whether that really is the case. Um, so we're, all we've got is kind of anecdotal evidence in that regard, but a typical roof permit generates a building permit uh, use tax and fee of about $400, $420 on average. So that's the kind of delta uh, that we're dealing with. So, you know, on a daily basis, we're issuing between 75 and 100 uh, permits. So at, you know, that's between, you know, 30 and $40,000, say, on a daily basis, at least for now, uh, that will eventually slow down. We have looked back at the 2009 storm just for parallels, and, you know, that first month after the storm was busy, the second month was busier, the third month was busier, the fourth month was less busy, and, and we'll see. I mean, will it follow that same cycle? Maybe, maybe not. The timing of that storm was a little different, too. It came later in the year, so winter hit us in terms of the ability to uh, stop doing roofs really ceases in kind of the November time frame just the temperature isn't conducive to getting a good roof uh, installation um, but we so the so the math uh, for the well just to kind of talk about our our, our, our model that we're trying to refine uh, and continue to refine uh, Patrick alluded to the fact that you know we we're, we're not sure we're we're totally there yet in terms of what we think is a proper customer service level we're continuing to do next day inspections uh, I've said it before, I'm, I'm sure at, a, at 130 permits or inspections a day at some days, I'm, I'm sure, you know, mistakes will be made, some things will be missed, but, but at, at a policy level, we're continuing to meet our expectation of next day uh, inspections, and uh, I, I don't think we've, we've had very few complaints at all uh, on that regard. Um, as we've said before, we're very flexible on that mid-roof requirement in terms of uh, allowing the contractors to be anywhere between 25% and 75% complete. Uh, that gives us the ability to look at what we need to do. Also gives them the ability to hopefully close out the job in one day or largely close it out in one day to move on to another project. Um, in terms of the resources, um, you know, Council will recall that initially we ceased our online in, in, uh, application process for building permits for just the reason that we're realizing is true, which is we, we felt like we'd have no ability to keep up with that volume of permit application uh, and w without additional resources. And we're, we're working on that. We've made some progress. We have a little more progress to make. But you, you'll see that we got, you know, on our first full day of having that online application uh, process on board, we got 225 applications, right? Uh, it ebbs and flows between them, but we were certainly right that they can submit applications much more quickly than we can process them without a lot more resources. Um, we've gotten some of those resources, we probably need some more. Uh, so we have two kind of back of house permit techs through Charles Abbott Associates. They were up there working when I came down here to work, um, trying to get that backlog uh, reduced. 
uh, we had initially thought, and it was a, it was a guess, right, that we, we were going to quote three to five business days to turn around those online permit applications. We frankly quickly fell behind, uh, in part because we had to kind of figure out that whole system and make sure we were kind of resourcing it properly in terms of what what we were doing, different administrative tasks, and who was responsible for what, and what the hours were. Uh, we had no shows come in where we, you know, thought we were going to issue 75 permits, but only 60 permit people uh, showed up. So we're overbooking in the spirit of the airlines now, uh, and hopefully that that gets us to that sweet spot. So we're still refining all those kind of procedures and protocols um, to try and get into a groove. We've, the two back of house permit techs really just process those online permits. Um, and I should be, we only have one now. We think we need two to get through that backlog. But, and then we've got two people at the front of house. Um, and, and frankly, our, our city staff permit tech, which we have one of right now, uh, really, we really, really need to get that individual focus just on the day to day work and, and probably largely get them out of the roof permit protocols and really have Charles Abbott be our full resource uh, for that. So we're, we're, we've requested an additional permit tech. I got word from Charles Abbott uh, that that person likely won't be able to start until uh, July 5th, so, uh, which is why they're working overtime tonight to, to help until that person gets involved. Uh, Commissioner or Councilmember Matthews mentioned the overtime. Uh, we certainly are get, having some overtime. Um, uh, and but I'm really sensitive to not burning out my team as well. So we kind of want to get to a model where we don't have to have consistently overtime for six months and really start to affect people's quality of life and uh, and work life balance. So we're trying to rely on Charles Abbott, uh, but that's challenging. I mean, it, you know, they're bringing in people from Georgia, from California, uh, which is where their bigger offices are. Uh, they are a, a firm that's growing their Colorado presence. So they're fully committed to supporting us and they're bringing in resources from afar. But it's a balancing act uh, with them as well because they're, they're pulling, it's busy in California and it's busy in Georgia too. So they're pulling those people away from other job sites where they were you know, engaged as well. So uh, we, we're currently using five contract inspectors a day in addition to our one city staff inspector. Uh, that equates to with the two the two permit techs and the five inspectors to about five thousand dollars a day. So to go back to the math from earlier, you know, if we're issuing uh, thirty thousand dollars worth of permits, we're certainly covering that that delta. Uh, and if we need you know more resources, we're prepared to do that. Uh, Charles Abbott is actually going to going to kind of create a bench of inspectors. So they're sensitive to the fact that they're uprooting people from their lives in other states to meet this storm uh, crisis need. Um, and they want to have a bench so that they can cycle pe people in for you know, three weeks and maybe give them a week back at, in California with their family and, and working at a California job. So they're managing that well, I think, and getting their arms around that. Um, so we're, uh, we're getting there. Uh, we're not quite there yet in terms of having the kind of what we think is kind of the the, the process and procedures and resources that we can march forward for the next four months, but we're real, we feel like we're getting real close. Uh, we've got a backlog. Uh, earlier today, the backlog was about 685 permits that have been submitted online, uh, but hadn't been yet reviewed and approved. Uh, that went up today, another busy day of the online permits. It went up to about 845 again, which is why they were working some overtime tonight to try and reduce that. Our goal, because we had initially quoted that three to five days, and we quickly went over that, uh, as, as many as I think about eight to ten business days. We got it back down to seven today in terms of the turnaround time. Our goal is, based on this work uh, this evening, is to get it down to six hopefully tomorrow. And I think the ultimate goal is to, you know, hopefully be able to achieve that five. But it's, it's all just a reflection of what the volume is, right? So uh, we can't control that. Uh, it ebbs and flows. And uh, again, when we get that additional permit tech from Charles Abbott here on July 5th. We hope that goes a long ways towards getting rid of that backlog and, and getting a more reasonable turnaround time uh, for processing those online permits. And the, the, the uh, inspectors are able to keep up once they, they are. are the they inspectors, uh, we've gotten extinct? them back to, uh, uh, they're not working as much overtime. Uh, and, and they're getting their jobs done. One of the challenges that we had initially was that they had so many inspections out there that when they got back in the office, it was, 
you know, they'd already worked nine hours and they had 25, 30, 40 uh, inspection results to right. enter into the system so that, uh, so that we know whether they passed a mid-roof. Uh, so if they were requesting a roof final, we could get that logged as well. So we're trying to get that sweet spot so that they can get their full duties done, not just their field duties, but also their office duties. And we're, uh, I think that five, for now, feels like it's the right number of inspectors to be able to do that. Um, <clears throat> do we have any idea about the number of permits issued per property, whether a property is required to have multiple permits with respect to decking and, and the roofing or with respect to the siding, the decking and the roofing or uh, as it relates to how many permits are being issued per property or whether it's a one permit per property or the, the, how the, that looks? Yeah, the roof decking um, is part of the same permit. Okay. Uh, and sometimes that comes up um, at during the construction, right? Because you, you deconstruct and get your shingles off and you find out whether your, your sheathing's any good. Uh, so we allow those folks to come in unscheduled to amend that roof permit and say, okay, it's gonna have decking. Changes the valuation and obviously changes what, we, you know, we're, what we're gonna look at in terms of nailing patterns and, and spacing on the deck, on the sheathing. Uh, if it's a exterior cladding or siding, uh, that would require a separate permit. Um, and I don't know the volume that we've been experiencing for those. I could certainly look into that. I mean, I know obviously we we're, we're having some of those. Sure. I don't think it's nearly as many as it was back in 2009, just because of the the nature of that storm being associated with a lot of wind uh, created a lot of damage to exterior uh, siding. And as it relates to the inspections, when the inspectors are doing that meter for inspecting, are they going up on the ladder up on the roof when they're doing those inspections? Yes. Okay. Um, and. The, uh, as it relates to the hours of the building department, uh, I've heard from both residents and contractors that uh, there's limited hours that they're able to access the building department. Is there a way to extend those hours to allow uh, better access uh, to the general public uh, to either receive permits or some way to uh, extend those hours to allow uh, either to be, be able to pick up a permit or otherwise access uh, the building department so that they can um, pick up a permit with uh, you know a reasonable time frame as opposed to uh, a shortened time period within the day uh, well let me let me describe to you what what, what our model is right now uh, we're we're issuing we, we open at seven in terms of when the staff comes in they, they, their hours for the building division staff are seven to four um, they for the first half hour they work on administrative tasks like uh, getting the, the books in order for the day, pulling off all the inspection requests and getting those scheduled. Uh, the, so we open for permit issuance at 7.30, uh, and at, at the back end we close at 3.30. Um, we've certainly been closing a lot later than that typically, but again, the goal is to kind of get back into a sustainable model uh, at some point in the future. From 7.30 to 10.30, uh, we're open to the general public. Uh, still the same system where people are pulling the ticket to get kind of in a queue, but we're open for all types of other than roof permits. So it's just a come as you are, get in line, get here sooner, you get a quicker number, you get in quicker. So that's how we're spending from 7.30 to 10.30. Uh, from 10.30, I've got to get all these numbers right for sure, but uh, f we have three windows between 10.30 and 3.30, or maybe it's 3.00. Uh, maybe Patrick's pulling it up here for me. <laughs> I guess uh, uh, it, if, if we can't get it straight, how is a roofer going to get it straight? Well, we do have it straight. Yeah. No, 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 I get that. But it's my, my concern is a roofer is... So, so a roofer, when they get their permit, uh, they're going to be given one of three windows, right? There's right. a window from 1030 to 12. 11 to, from 11 to 1230. 11 to 1230. 1230 okay. to 2 or 2 to 330. So there's three windows. So they, they have an hour and a half window to pull their permits. And when they, when they get noticed via email for their online permit, uh, they receive that notice of that window, so a date and a time. And then when they come in, same thing, they pull a ticket, they get in the queue, but they're in that queue for that hour and a half. Right. I mean, the whole reason we went to the hour and a half uh, or, or the, to the online process again is, is that we, you know, we found it unacceptable too that when we realized people were queuing up at 6 a.m. in the morning right. and still maybe not getting a permit right that day that was just not acceptable as a customer service model right. so the the weight is significantly reduced right they come in for an hour and a half window uh, and so, presumably if they get in at the front end of that window they're going to get in at the, the front end of that hour and a half and i guess from my perspective it seems like 
and I appreciate that we're concerned about the quality of life and the work-life balance of the employees, but we're also concerned about the quality of life and the work-life balance of the residents and making sure that they have a good quality of life while the, the roofing material is sitting waiting on their roofs and whatnot and making sure that this is done in a timely manner. I've gotten a lot of calls from residents waiting on these permits and wondering when this is going to be done. And, and so I, I want to make sure that uh, we, we are, and I, I see a lot of progress being made, but I, I can only see this getting um, worse over time, as we've indicated, that the, the, the member permit, the, the backlog is only growing over time. And I just want to make sure that uh, we continue to uh, throw as much resources as we can at this and understand that the quality of life and the work-life balance of staff is going to suck for the time being. It's just that that's just the way of the storm is going to be and that's just the nature of the situation and I'm sorry that that's the way it is but that's the, that's the, the nature of the situation and, and we will do everything we can to support the staff through this and that's what overtime pay is, 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 is uh, designed for but uh, that's what we want to make sure that we uh, sort of understand that we are here for the residents, not for the staff. That's what we, we want to make sure that we have that right perspective, and that's what I want to get through, that we, we have that understanding that as much as we appreciate everything that the staff is doing, and they're doing a great job under tremendous pressure, and they're, they're cranking these out at record speed, that uh, we also understand that uh, the number of residents looking for permits is only going to grow as we get towards the end of summer because as I talked to both contractors and residents, uh, majority of people are, are still waiting on pulling a permit. Uh, majority of people haven't even considered getting the roof done yet. So the, the worst is yet to come on this. And I'd still like to see uh, changes to that mid-roof uh, inspection process, either through an affidavit or otherwise. And I'd like uh, council to consider that. And um, I, I just, I think we need to, uh, as much as we don't have additional resources or staff to throw at this, then the next step is to consider what can we do to uh, streamline the process. And I brought that up before, but I haven't gotten much support on that. So I want to see what we can do to streamline this because this is only going to get worse with time. Done. That's it. See. Nothing. Thanks. Pleasure. So, just to reiterate, this report will be uh, generated every two weeks. I'm assuming by next two weeks we'll have some labor costs in here. This will be posted on the city's website. And uh, I think that um, what I'd like to see all of our elected officials do when you're talking to your constituents is use these financial reports, this information as backup, because I see a lot of misinformation on social media and other places where people are saying it's taking a month to get a permit. And I mean, it's always the city's fault. And I'm not necessarily sure that all contractors are organized enough to get their, themselves in the queue. And you know, if they schedule themselves right, they can get their mid-roof inspection the same day they're doing the roof. And um, they can just, yeah, so I think that has, it's, be holding on everybody, elected officials and staff and the contractors and the residents to make sure that they're organized as much as they can when they're trying to get their, their property fixed because it's not all the city's fault on a lot of these things, especially when someone says it's taking a month to get a permit and you know, then that just perpetuates itself and exacerbates itself and then it's six months. And like we've mentioned, this is probably gonna be a year process that people will be pulling permits for, the, for their rooms next spring, next summer, if they wait and they don't have leaks they'll probably wait for a while because they don't want to pay two deductibles. That was one of the comments on social media was they don't want to um, pull a permit now because they don't want to have another storm come in and then they're paying two deductibles on their roof. So and the final thing I was going to ask, does anybody have any questions or comments on this before it goes live um, tomorrow on the website? Any, if you have any changes or don't understand any of the information, please let myself know or Mr. Goff or Mr. Johnstone that we can tweak it for every two weeks. Any questions or comments on this? I really do want to thank staff um, for the work they've done in this, plus keeping us very informed as to what's going on. It helps us all as elected officials to talk to our constituents and explain things. Uh, we've all received some calls and, and had opportunity to, to give them some information, which is really appreciated by our citizens. 
elected officials, managers, let's down the, go down our council members. Ms. Duran? I'll try to make this short, <laughs> Janice. <laughs> Um, I have partnered with West 29th Marketplace. We're doing a book drive, and that includes Wheat Ridge Poultry, Twisted Smoothie, and the Style uh, Nail Salon. And it's going to be from uh, July 1st through July 31st. And you can, let's see here, if you take three books in to Wheat Ridge Poultry and you make a purchase that day, you'll get 10% off your purchase. Also the same with Twisted Smoothie. If you donate three books, you'll get 10% off your purchase for that day. If you have any questions, you can contact me through my city email or my number, 720-312-0583. And all these books are going to be donated to Reach Out and Read Colorado. Thank you. Ms. Hoppy, Mrs. Hoppy, none tonight, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, I just would like to take a moment to recognize the facility coordinator, Brian Blazer, with the Wheat Ridge Rec Center for his heroic actions and his uh, attentive nature to the medical needs of a patron at the rec center on Friday morning and without getting into the details of the incident, uh, his uh, quick action and his ability to handle uh, a very tragic situation uh, was uh, well recognized by the patrons of the rec center and uh, I would like to see uh, the council in some way, shape or form uh, do some sort of recognition or otherwise uh, commend him for his actions and his uh, ability to uh, be able to uh, handle that situation with uh, great leadership and, and ability to deal with that situation as, as tragic as it was and uh, at the same time thank the rest of the team at the rec center for dealing with that situation and, and uh, handling it with grace and uh, it was obviously uh, but it, but more than that, being able to show back up on Monday morning and uh, uh, be able to uh, handle everything uh, just as it was because uh, that, that takes just as much courage as anything. So to Brian Blazer, I know that you uh, uh, are a great uh, city employee and I just appreciate everything you do for the rec center and all the patrons that come in there every day. So thank you to you and uh, really appreciate all of your efforts. Um, I want to also thank uh, Breckenridge Brewery and the Saints Peter and Paul community. Uh, thanks to their efforts, we collected over 2,000 diapers over the weekend for the inaugural Pints for Pampers event, and uh, that was uh, uh, to benefit the uh, Jefferson County uh, Human Services, which is currently out of diapers. So if you have any extra diapers, feel free to donate them to the Jefferson County Human Services. And then uh, as it relates to uh, the Green Belt, uh, I sent an email to the West Metro Fire District asking uh, what we can do to educate residents who live along the, uh, the ridge and along the Green Belt to educate them about the, uh, uh, what it means to live in an urban wildlife, uh, urban wildland interface and understanding uh, the need to clear brush away from your property and making sure that we understand the need to uh, protect your home from wildfires. So uh, that's all I have for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Thank you for appreciating those staff. I will um, talk to Joyce Mandory and see if there's something we can do to recognize those staff in front of council. Mr. Fitzgerald. I have really nothing but just uh, talking about the urban wildlife. I saw a deer cross 32nd Avenue the other day. Actually, there was one, it was, I think it was at the concert, there was a deer concert in the park, which is, those are wonderful if you're not attending those. Mr. Matthews. Not tonight, thank you. No. no. Uh, the the, the um, city clerk, I forgot to ask you earlier. Got nothing, no. Okay. I did attend the um, Wheat Ridge Senior Resource Center Gala fundraiser which was a wonderful fundraiser for the, for the seniors, Senior Resource Center, as well as the celebration of John Sabawa's retirement after over 30 years of service. I can't remember, it was 33, 35. He kind of cried. <laughs> it was just very, very tender. Lovely, lovely, lovely thing to do. Um, I believe that's it, folks, and uh, wish you all good night.